Hello and welcome to another edition of Bread Theory. My name is Zach, I am your host for this evening, and tonight I have a very special guest who will be joining me uh, shortly. He's running late right now, but it's going to be my brother Devin. So he's going to come on and we're going to go through chapter 13 of The Conquest of Bread uh, by Peter Kropotkin. All right, so joining me now is my brother Devin. Say hey. hello. Hello, everyone. Um, so uh, what I usually like to do with, with my guests is I have them uh, state their pronouns for the, the audience and then give as much of your bi biography as you feel comfortable talking about, any sort of political influences that you've had. And cool. Whatever you feel like sharing, so take it away. Uh, pronouns are he, him. My name is Devin. Uh, Grew up with Zach, <laughs> big political influence on me. <laughs> oh, wow, thank you. Yeah, uh, and yeah, grew up in Minnesota, now live out in California, and I work in healthcare, and yeah. Yeah, very cool, yeah. very cool. Would you say there's any particular moment that you can put your finger on that, that shaped your political journey more than, than others? Um. Well, I actually do remember you being into politics uh, when I was like in middle school. Okay. So and I remember been, like, thinking, yeah, they're dumb and a waste of time. Well, I mean, I can't argue with you there. <laughs> <laughs> and then you were like, no, they really matter. And yeah. then I feel like I started to get into them, actually. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Very so cool. I remember that. Very and cool. And then, yeah, I don't know. I studied environmental policy in undergrad, and that was that was definitely big. I'm sure. A big kind of turning point, for sure. But I don't know. It's just how we were raised, too. Like, mom and dad care a lot, obviously. And, Absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. Grandpa as well. Yeah. Yeah. Grandpa, yep. for sure. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It's been kind of like a... Almost like a lifelong thing, I suppose. An interest. And then, obviously, more recently... Uh, I think we've all been waking up a little bit more politically. Oh boy, yeah. Um, everyone's on a leftist arc, hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully so. <laughs> hopefully we can pull a few more out. Yeah. So. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. Would you Would you feel comfortable stating if there's a political theory or, or group of, of ideologies sure. that you trend towards more than others? Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I've kind of wondered, like, how to there's so many different camps now it feels like but yeah. generally just left leaning you know leftist that's cool i guess yeah that's cool yeah what, what does leftist mean to you uh well that's a good question i guess i yeah i think i believe in well i guess like socially quite left leaning so mm -hmm. like you know pro trans anti-racist mm -hmm. uh you know believe that the system that we currently live under is pretty demonstrably racist and you know yep. built to uh serve the entrenched power structures that have existed since the founding of this country and people don't have enough uh, say in their general lives. I definitely believe in, you know, uh, more, I guess, like democratization of workplaces mm -hmm. and uh, really just our, our daily lives. Absolutely. And yeah, more freedom, more, more say in your destiny. Yeah, Good exactly. Stuff. Yeah. So, I don't know. What do you say you are? I, I tend to... to say anarcho-communist kind of kind of you know i've been most influenced through through this book that we're reading right now actually the the conquest uh -huh. of bread um but i mean there, there's elements of various traditions of leftism that that i find valuable and and um for me mostly it's it's the things like mutual aid um and uh extreme democratization of of every facet of life that that attracts me more towards the anarchist side I mean, if we're looking at just kind of the basic four quadrants political spectrum, I always end up in the, the very yeah, same here. bottom left corner. Same so here. that just fits me. But it, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not a sectarian in that I'm not going to call everyone a tanky if they, they like Lenin. We're going to go through Lenin at some point on this channel. We'll go through all those Mao, all the different uh, influential communist thinkers as well. 
Um, so, so I guess more than anything, I believe in left unity, and that just, I mean, yeah, for sure. Even now in this this politically charged era, there's just so few people that that are actually ready to move beyond a capitalist system that. I think we got to take everyone that we can, really. Yeah, <laughs> we can't be so picky about who we have as, as, as our allies. Right. And um, our co-collaborators. Yeah. So, so that's how I would describe myself. Nice. Yeah. I think that makes sense, mm-hmm. definitely. That's yeah. why, like, yeah, it seemed like for a while the term on the left was just liberal. Yeah. And then... Right. And then it was, like, progressive... Yeah, yeah and now I, I moved to that phase year, as well too. It seems yeah. to be like the left, like the political left, and I right. think it's like it's felt like the left didn't have an identity for a long oh, time no. in politics in America. Like yeah. it was all on neoliberal terms, I guess. Absolutely, like, at least since Reagan. Yeah. Yeah. So, I kind of think like, a, yeah, a wide tent is what is needed for sure. Like. Um, there's definitely a lot of like infighting it seems like and that seems counterproductive to me super counterproductive yeah we're all on the same team by and large Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. um but yeah it's been cool to see the left waking up a little more and uniting a little bit more it's like there's it seemed like there were so many disparate causes yeah that really were saying the same like making the same central criticisms I guess of capitalism and stuff and so Mm -hmm. I think it's like felt more united in general but it probably needs to continue I suppose oh Um, yeah I absolutely think that's the case yeah Yeah, I I mean I really um, give credit to to Bernie Sanders for yeah for sure at least waking up that conversation again you know as as much as he he governs more towards a, a uh, social democrat rather than even a democratic socialist uh, at least he's made it acceptable to talk about even the word socialism without right. completely being dismissed uh, just right out of hand right so yeah it's it's it was definitely a, a long time where yeah that side was just not even heard at all well and like yeah I definitely think that's true and I feel like there is a faction of the online left that is like very critical of Bernie Sanders and I oh think for sure insane. and AOC like, yeah it's like you wouldn't even be having this conversation if they hadn't like helped to wake up millions of people and right. like start a mass leftist movement I mean Absolutely. like you know it just didn't exist like before Bernie like in any big way you know right before yeah. that Barack was the like crazy liberal left, yeah. left guy yeah. you know and like he certainly ran on a more populist uh, uh, like platform, but then he governed as a centrist. Governed very, very so. centrist. Like, like yeah. yeah. So, like, Bernie was, like, wildly successful in the grand scheme, even if he didn't get the nomination. Like, and I think that he, in his policies, like, are the voice of the Democratic Party in many ways. Like, he's he's been okay. super influential. Like, I think... Mm-hmm. I think Biden kind of recognizes that the people are with Bernie. Like, Bernie had a movement. Right. Biden just happened to be deemed more electable, you know? He just outlasted but everyone, it's basically. It's not like he had ideas. He no, get, no, no, no. He didn't get elected because he had ideas. He's, he's he just, not talking about moving the country forward in any great way. Right. So the ideas and the enthusiasm are coming from the left right now, for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. And Bernie's a, like a, the <laughs> de facto leader of that movement still. Yeah, in many ways, and then obviously AOC and the squad and Ilhan and yeah, it's been, it's been and great to see this. them all rise up. Yeah, so gotta expand the squad. Absolutely, that'd be good. That would be good. That'd be a good, good uh, next thing to do. And I think we did this last cycle too. So that yep. was good. yeah, added a couple new people. I believe, yeah, so yeah, but yeah, long yeah. road. Oh, definitely long road. <laughs> and a lot of it's gonna depend on on who runs in this midterm. And then, again, who runs in, in the next presidential election. Yeah. As, as much as we should not only focus on presidential politics, yeah. they do have a, a pretty huge influence, at least in America. Right, right. With how things go, how, you know, what the country's talking about. And, yeah. And that's well, and, I mean, I mean and, but that's another thing that I think Bernie doesn't get enough credit for, mm-hmm. is like, 
like his national platform became a platform that local candidates could uh, adopt and run and win on too you know Mm -hmm. like so the presidency like does matter from that perspective like it sets it sets a an agenda and a a platform that local candidates can then yeah run on and be successful right you know Right. So there's, there's a there's a national touchstone that they can be like yeah yeah I'm, yeah I'm like that person yeah exactly so yeah I mean it's definitely not all about the presidency I do think for sure the left is you know and Democrats in general are a little more focused on that and Republicans seem to be more focused on local and that also stinks yeah because <laughs> like, they're better at the local stuff I think well yeah I mean and it tends to be especially in small towns that uh, groups like the Chamber of Commerce which is almost always uh, a, a very right uh, organization. They, they tend to have a pretty large influence on elections as well as police unions. Right. Um, those tend to be some of the heavy hitters in local government. So, they, you know, things tend to, to skew that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Um, so I think we're going to switch gears from uh, put that, that Dennis Prager video on hold that I was watching just in the, the interim there. And we're going to get into the uh, main piece of the night, which is going to be going through the audiobook uh, of Chapter 13 of The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin. And um, so whenever you feel like you have a, a comment you want to say about it, don't, don't hesitate. Just you know, say pause or, or whatever. Cool. And we'll just kind of go with whatever, uh, you know, takes hold of our minds. And, you know, I like to keep things pretty freewheeling and, and don't worry about going off on tangents. Those usually produce interesting uh things to talk about you know and and more relevant things to talk about um especially considering this book is about 130 years old so <laughs> i mean a lot of the ideas are, are still quite relevant but yeah but it, it helps to kind of bridge that gap with some some modern examples and stuff like that yeah all right well let's cool. let's get right into it uh, so this is chapter 13 of the conquest of bread by peter kropotkin And the chapter is titled, The Collectivist Wages System. So let's get into it. This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Chapter 13, The Collectivist Wages System. Just a little. It is our opinion that collectivists commit a twofold error in their plans for the reconstruction of society. While speaking of abolishing capitalist rule, they intend, nevertheless, to retain two institutions which are the very basis of this rule, representative government and the wages system. As regards so-called representative government, we have often spoken about it. It is absolutely incomprehensible to us that intelligent men, and such are not wanting in the collectivist party, can remain partisans of national or municipal parliaments after all the lessons history has given them, in France, in England, in Germany, or in the United States. While we see parliamentary rule breaking up and from all sides criticism of this rule growing louder, not only of its results but also of its principles, how is it that revolutionary socialists defend a system already condemned to die? built up by the middle classes to hold their own against royalty, sanctioning and at the same time strengthening their sway over the workers, parliamentary rule is preeminently a middle class rule. The upholders of this system have never seriously affirmed that a parliament or a municipal council represent a nation or a city. The most intelligent among them know that this is impossible. The middle class has simply used the parliamentary system to raise a barrier between itself and royalty, without giving the people liberty. But gradually, as the people become conscious of their interests and the variety of their interests multiply, the system can no longer work. Therefore, Democrats of all countries vainly imagine palliatives. The referendum is tried and found to be a failure. Proportional representation is spoken of, so is representation of minorities, and other parliamentary utopias. In a word, they strive to find what is not to be found, and they are compelled to recognize that they are in a wrong way, and confidence in a representative government disappears. It is the same with the wages system. 
just going to pause it right there for, for one second. So basically what, what Kropotkin is, is trying to say is that these, these representative systems tend to favor the middle class and, and then also the, the upper classes more than any other. And, and I, I think there is a lot of truth to that. Uh, when, you, when you think of any sort of representative government, even, even down to the local level, the people that tend to be uh, the representatives, first, first and foremost, you have to have money to run a campaign uh, and the extra time to run a campaign, um, as well as connections to influential donors, influential people that, that can help you uh, be successful in, in running. And that's, that's kind of a closed door to your average person who's, who's working nonstop just to scrape by mm -hmm. uh, and just doesn't have the, the resources to, to become a representative. So, so I think there's a lot of truth to the idea that representative democracy is, is inherently favoring the, the, the middle class and also composed of the, the middle and upper classes. Right. I mean, we certainly, it's mostly upper class, our representative democracy. Well, I mean, yeah, uh, definitely the, the further up you go, the chain, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, you, I guess, yeah, you basically like, have to be rich to, to be a national. Right. And then there are exceptions, like, you know, AOC was, was a bartender right. or, or a barista or something like that uh, before she ran. And, and, but it was, it, you know, it was a struggle for her to, to get things set up initially. She was talking about having to take out loans to set up an office and move across to uh, D.C. And, and all this stuff. Right. Um, yeah, and she still has student loans I'm, I, uh, to pay off. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, so, crazy, yeah. so, so if you're the type of person to believe that, that we live in some sort of meritocracy where the, 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 the best of the people just get sorted out into the highest positions and the lowest of people, well, they, for one reason or another, deserve that, this might seem like a fine system to you to, right. have, to have a system that favors the people that deserve to be there more than others. Uh, but to be on the left, I think you really have to reject that idea altogether and realize that there's tons of potential that is, that is squandered every day uh, by people that, that work, uh, you know, so-called menial jobs, uh, work in factories, work in fast food, uh, do trucking, transportation, your gardeners, you know. Right. Uh, people that, that, if they had their basic needs met, uh, could contribute a lot more to the greatness of society, whatever that means to you. They, they could invent a new thing. They could uh, help make their com the community better. Uh, by, you know, donating their time to, to help out um, youth or, or whatever. They, they could be an educator. They could do any number of things if, if they were set free from, uh, the, the, you know, the kind of shackles that they're in that, that keeps them just on that treadmill just trying to survive. Now, did they have a definition of the middle class back then? As far as I know, they, they did have... I, I don't know how much it maps onto our definition of the middle class um i would assume the people that they're talking about are more what, what would be called the, the petty or the petite bourgeoisie uh the the business owners for the most part that are, are yeah money was different then um but I, I think it would mostly be like business owners um uh people in in the clergy uh other people that, that weren't quite at the, at the level of aristocracy, they couldn't make decisions that would change an entire nation, but they could make decisions that would affect employment in a small village uh, or, or affect how, how well a particular area did um, in trade or something like that. So it may not be just a, a numerical thing like we think of today where the middle class is just, you know, you make, I don't even know what it is right now, I think median income is like $60,000 in the U.S., something like that. And if you make around that or higher, you're in the middle class, and, and, and I don't I don't know if it was necessarily that strict of a of a division, right. uh, but I know the term was in use. Uh, I, I I read a book, um, uh, Robinson Crusoe, last year, and I think that was set at just about the turn of the 17th century, so late late 1500s. Um, Maybe, maybe early 1600s, I'm not quite sure, but it was set in that time anyway. And, and they talked about how the middle class, like the, there's like this new thing, the middle class. So at least the term had been around for a while, mm -hmm. but, but that, that's a good point. I, I don't know how much it, it actually maps on, but I, th I think we can take that concept and, and, and look at the people that, that have the most power today and, and again see that 
you know, like I said, if, if you're in a lower level job, not necessarily going to be as influential in the political process as someone that has time and money to dispose of. Yeah. Basically. The time to, it's like the big thing. Time is really critical. <laughs> And, and even if you were to, to, to get to a better system of, of some sort of like direct democracy where perhaps every neighborhood had, you know, its, its own, um, I don't want to say sovereignty, but basically they decided the rules for their own area um, and then were part of a, a, some sort of democratic confederation with, with other neighborhoods in a city. Even if you get to that point where, you know, you could go to a meeting and, and, and have a voice in the way things are, are set up in your neighborhood. If you have kids, that, that, that really takes away from your ability to, to just set everything aside and, and, and go participate, even if it was a direct democracy. Uh, right. So, so the, I, I think if, if, if we were to get to the point, though, where everyone's needs were met and... We, we could have these sorts of more direct democratic meetings even on a, on a, on a citywide level or something like that. When you get up to the major cities, that, that, that becomes pretty unworkable. But, right. but even if it was like a neighborhood level in the larger cities and just a town-wide thing in the smaller towns, if we could get to the point where everyone could have a real direct say in, in the policies of, of where they live, um, you still got to factor in for people being able to be there and participate. So you, that means you have to take care of their needs. You have to take care of their basic needs, mm -hmm. which may include things like childcare. Right. Um, it may include things like food. Like if it happens over the dinner hour, not everyone's gonna have time to go home after work, make a meal, and then go out to this, this town meeting or whatever. So things to, to keep in mind if, if you're you know, looking to have a more democratic society. Well, yeah, and then, I mean, there's a lot of ballot initiatives in California, like mm -hmm. direct democracy, so to speak. But yeah. Like, basically, I think they did a study that showed that, like, the, the like whichever side of the initiative had more money spent towards it is the one that wins, ev like, every time, like, without fail. Right. So it kind of begs the question of are the people even really, you know, like, I mean, it comes down to a lot of things, I guess, right. but just, like, informed enough, like, you know, and then we're all very easily swayed by marketing. Advertising. And yeah. advertising. It's a, it's a multi-billion dollar <clears throat> industry for a reason. Yeah, so, like, that makes direct democracy hard, at least at that scale. Right. So. I, I think that's a big reason why, in, in some of the previous chapters of this book, Kropotkin has said... You can't just change this one part of the system and just have everything be okay. It has to right. be a complete transformation. He's talking about even doing away with things like, like currency and um, private property ownership. Like, right. like you could still have your, your home, which the term has been muddled, but, but basically that, that would be considered personal property. Things for your personal use, for your personal survival, that becomes personal property. But there's no private property. You couldn't own an entire business. You couldn't own the roads. Right. You couldn't own anything that would be in common with your fellow citizens. You couldn't have a, pr a private park where you would pay money to get into, something like that. Right. Because these are all ways that people can, can use leverage over an entire group of, of their fellow citizens to, to shift things the way they want to. Yeah. And I think advertising falls within that, too. Um, you just can't allow people to hoard money to the point where they have such great influence that no one can really even compete with them. Otherwise, the, the entire concept of democracy starts to break down. Ooh, excuse me. All right, well, let's, let's continue on a little bit, and we'll see what else he has to say. For after having proclaimed the abolition of private property and the possession in common of all means of production, how can they uphold the wages system in any form? It is, nevertheless, what collectivists are doing. Hold on, just wanted to address one more comment. Uh, Empathy Lady says, nowadays it's all about the middle class. Even every politician touts the middle class. They right. rarely speak directly to the lower classes. And that's absolutely true. That was another thing that, that I think Bernie really brought back to the conversation. Was right. He actually talked about working people for once. He talked about unions. He talked about class solidarity and all these sorts of concepts that had just kind of faded into the background since 
neoliberalism kind of took hold. Right. So, so yeah, that, that also shows who, I mean, who at least the politicians think are the most influential on the system. They're right. obviously trying to pander towards the people that they think are most likely to come out in force to vote for them. Um, or at least the, the people that they can convince could be part of that club that, that is, you know, middle class or wealthy. If they just, you know, work hard and keep their head down and stuff like that. So they're definitely pandering towards a, a, a certain sort of class sensibility. Right. I wonder what an average politician would say is makes you middle class. I feel like they would all have very different ideas. Oh, sure. I know, yeah. <laughs> about what it means. Like, did you see, like, the New York Democratic, uh, New York City Democratic mayor candidates? Like, in one debate, they asked him, like, remember this. how much does yeah. a house cost in Brooklyn? And, like, that's, one that's guy weird. said, a, like, $100,000. <laughs> and another said, like, a, uh, probably, like, 150000 oh, or something just, crazy. Just hedging, like the, hedging the bets there. And it was, like... Uh, you guys are off for like an order of magnitude. It's like a million dollars. Oh yeah, like, what's and that's wrong the, with you. That's for like a very small <laughs> condo. Right. That's I right. mean exactly. to get anything that, that you could have like a whole family in that would be. So I wonder, like when they multiple. say middle class, like what do these politicians have in their minds? Like, I bet they have someone richer than middle class in their minds. Probably. Oh, almost certainly. You know, almost certainly. Once, once you them. reach a certain level of wealth, you have you are completely out of touch with right. the day-to-day -day lives of, of people. You can't understand not having an extra $20 to, to take the bus or right. having to choose which food you, you, you grocery shop for. Right. I, mean, I mean, there were some friends of ours, uh, Amanda and I, who they're, they're, they're doing well. Um, they, they together make over six figures. Um, and I, I happened to ask them one time, hey, so can you guys just buy whatever food you feel like? And they're like, well, well, yeah, yeah, of course. We can just we just go to the store, we buy what we feel like, and, and it was no big deal. And I'm like, what is that like life like? Because uh, in my adult life, that's never been the case for me. And I'm not doing poorly. I, I, I myself make like three times the, the minimum wage. And yet still, I, can't, I, I still have to budget things. Right. I, I, I can't just live my life, you know, here and there, just go out to eat whenever I feel like. All these things have to be at least, at the very least, conversations and negotiations <laughs> between my wife and I about what we can actually afford. We have we we don't have unlimited resources, right. and I guarantee you that 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 virtually no politicians, especially at the federal level, ever have to worry about these sorts of things, and probably are unaware that others do. <laughs> it's like the Lucille Blue Bluth. <laughs> Yes. How much could a banana possibly cost? Ten dollars. <laughs> yes. Oh man. Oh, that show was so good. That was the best. <laughs> Just the way they portrayed the, the out of touchness of, of rich people. That well, makes I, me, yeah. That makes me think too of, of how none of them knew what a chicken sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool, 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 cool. Right. They all had their own. I ideas. feel like that's like what politicians think of as middle class. Absolutely. It's like that type of family. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Just like, a small time real estate family. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like a small business owner, which like, right. Actually, like most small business owners are like pretty well off, I think. Right. Like, I would I think mean, so. Obviously, it depends on the business. But, yeah. Like, yeah. I don't know. That's what it seems like. I guess I don't know. Yeah. I'm I, not saying it's easy. I'm just saying. No, no, no. But but if you're an owner of a business. You're already you already you already own something. Yes. And like something yes, that you can make yes, money you're on. You're taking a risk, but still, I mean, yeah. So, anyways, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We don't think about the lower class. It's like there's like disdain for the lower class, so yeah. to speak. You know. Yeah. Yeah. That that brings up another thing. I I, I just started reading uh, David Graeber's book, uh, Bullshit Jobs. Um. And he was talking, he keeps bringing up this point where the people that he would encounter who had these jobs that by their own definition were worthless, they could go away tomorrow and, and would, it would not make a, a, a bit of difference. They'd be people like yes men for a, a middle manager in a, in a big company or um, someone in banking that just moves money around and, and you know, right. doesn't actually accomplish anything. These sorts of people. And he would talk about how much disdain they had for people that, that actually did work that, that, that did make a difference in people's mm -hmm. lives, like teachers and firefighters, all these people. And, and, and the theory that he had was that 
they resent the fact that they actually get to do something with their work. And they also want to be paid well for it. It's like mm-hmm. their, their idea is it has to be one or the other. Either you get paid well or you do something worthwhile. It, it can't be both. Right. Just such a bizarre frame of mind. Yeah. But, I mean, that is how the, the, our society tends to sort itself out. With, with the exception of, you know, say a doctor or a surgeon or a very high-priced lawyer, uh, there's, there's, there's not many jobs that are very vital to society and also get paid well. Right. I mean, teacher, firefighter, social worker. Oh, boy. Social worker even involves like an extra year of schooling, I believe. Right. I, I looked into social work when I was in college. Um, it's like an extra year Most of schooling. Of masters, yeah, I think educated. Yeah. But yeah, but like even with a master's, like their average salary is like 48000 a year. Yeah. Like, and that's after a few years of getting to it, yeah. of being in the business. Like, you know, nonprofit sector, all, the, all these different jobs that are really vital, that really do important things, that are just compensated like they're worthless. Mm-hmm. It's such a strange inversion, yeah. it seems like to me. It, it is, yeah. It's, we value weird things. <laughs> we do value weird things. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. That's weird. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's continue on a little bit here when they recommend labor checks. It is easy to understand why the early English socialists came to the system of labor checks. They simply tried to make capital and labor agree. They repudiated the idea of violently laying hands on capitalist property. It is also easily understood why Proudhon took up the idea later on. In his mutualist system, he tried to make capital less offensive notwithstanding the retaining of private property, which he detested from the bottom of his heart. Just one note on, on Proudhon. Um, he, was, he was, by many, considered one of the fathers of anarchy. Came out around the same time. He was kind of an intellectual rival of Marx. Um, and it's a really dry read, but I do recommend his book, What is Property?, where he just kind of goes through and he's like, you know... Um, Say you have a piece of private property. Well, how do you have legitimate title to that? Well, I bought it. Well, who'd you buy it from? And he, and he, and he said that if you, go, if you go back far enough, you'll find that that land was stolen or, or conquered or in, or in some ways uh, violence was used in order to get it. And he says, well, and because of that, all private property is illegitimate. Um, he, st- he again still believes in personal property. He you know, understands people have to have a place to live where no one can just walk in the door and take whatever they feel like. But he, he, he's talking more about, like, again, the means of production, the means of making a living, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a good book, What is Property? Um, it's available on LibriVox, which is, is a free audiobook service you can, you can check out. Um, and yeah, he, he was, he, he never quite got to the point of wanting to completely abolish capitalism but he, he hated private property and mm. he thought it was all illegitimate uh there was there's no rational basis for it it's, it's all just a fiction worked up by people trying to make themselves feel uh less bad about having something they ne- shouldn't necessarily have right sorry just thought i'd mention that yeah, before. Interesting. but which he believed to be necessary to guarantee individuals against the state Neither is it astonishing that certain economists, more or less bourgeois, admit labor checks. They care little whether the worker is paid in labor notes or in coin stamped with the effigy of the republic or the empire. They only care to save from destruction individual ownership of dwelling houses, of land, of factories. In any case, that of dwelling houses and the capital that is necessary for manufacturing and labor notes would just answer the purpose of upholding this private property. As long as labor notes can be exchanged for jewels or carriages, the owner of the house will willingly accept them for rent. And as long as dwelling houses, fields, and factories belong to isolated owners, men will have to pay them, in one way or another, for being allowed to work in the fields or factories, or for living in the houses. The owners will accept to be paid by the workers in gold, in paper money, or in checks, exchangeable for all sorts of commodities. But how can we defend labor notes, this new form of wagedom, when we admit that all houses, fields, and factories 
will no longer be private property and that they will belong to the commune or the nation. Okay. So the idea behind a labor note is, is it's not that far different from our currency right now. So if a dollar represents you've done, you know, X amount of effort at your job, a labor note is, is basically the same thing, saying I've worked so-and-so amount of time or done, you know, moved this amount of bushels of, of wheat or whatever, this, this sort of thing, and then you just exchange that like regular currency. And, you, and what he's saying is it's not really enough of a difference to make a transformational change in society. Um, it's, it's just another form of currency and people are going to end up exploiting it. You'll have right. rent seekers of various kinds, whether it's literally landlords or whether it's people that just speculate on land or, or want to own a business again and, and, and not have to necessarily participate in the labor of that business. It'll just be exploited by these people again. So he's, he's basically just saying that it's, uh, it's not going to get us there. So. Who's it? Who, and who is proposing that solution? Uh, Where does it come from? Yeah, I'm not quite sure. I think he's talking about other anarchists and other and other communists as well, who mm-hmm. who are who've been talking about how to build up uh, um, a more I don't want to say utopian, but but just a better form of society, mm-hmm. a more egalitarian form of society. And I, I guess that was one of the systems because that's one of the things that that it's it's really hard for people to wrap their head around. I mean, like. I can say I'm not even in, entirely there myself. The idea of just doing away with all money right. and, and just having people uh, exchange whatever they're good at. And just, you know, you know you, you're a, a welder. You just go around and you weld for whoever needs it. And, yeah. and just by virtue of you doing that, your neighbors know that you are, are, are part of this society and they will give you the things that you need. So you can just walk into a shop and get your groceries, get your clothing, um, you can go to, uh, I don't know, a dance club and, and dance without having to pay cover charge or anything like that. You just you get to live your life because you're contributing. Um, but then that would also include people that, that, for whatever reason, don't contribute. But the idea being that on the whole, people will just naturally contribute what they find that they're good at or what they find that they can do that's useful for other people or mm-hmm. what they like or whatever. And that even though it's complex, you know, it all comes out in the wash and, and basically everyone's needs get met. Um, it does, it, but then it gets more murky when you come to things like trade. So, I mean, how can you have a neighbor nation or even a neighbor city that, that does still believe in currency and capitalism and stuff like that? How do you even approach trading with them? And I mean, we're at the point in, in this, this, global economy where if we're going to maintain our level of technology we need things like lithium and, and rare earth minerals that are not available everywhere right you still have to trade in, in one one way or another right um so it does be it does become complicated it, it's hard to imagine a system beyond that but you know that, i think this book is really just supposed to be pointing people in the right direction so they can just begin thinking of these ideas so that when the time comes you know something will work itself out mm. Or even after a revolution happens, people will just naturally set up, um, you know, systems. Y- you think of something like like an ant colony. There, there's a queen, yes, but they don't. The queen doesn't really control the ants. Doesn't doesn't tell them where to go to get food. Doesn't tell them how to build the tunnels. Doesn't tell them anything. All the queen does is produce more ants. But they behave like a complex organism, and the way they do that is through things like scent trails. An ant finds just in its wanderings, and its wanderings may look random, but there is a purpose to it. They'll, they'll tend to sweep back and forth across an area. And if they happen to come across uh, a piece of food that's fallen on the ground, they will figure, they will start a scent trail back to the colony. And then, as the, and then the other ants, as mm-hmm. they wander around, some of them are going to start crossing that scent trail. And eventually they start forming a line. You see, everyone's seen a line of ants, I'm sure, going to and from some piece of food or some obstacle that they're, they're trying to conquer. There's no grand intelligence controlling all of that, and yet everything gets done just through the natural workings of the way that ants work. And so the same sort of thing could be true of people. People naturally are drawn to one sort of work or another, right. and of, you know eventually they sort themselves out, and, 
And maybe if it comes to the point where there's some things that no one wants to do, we can either figure out together how to automate that or we'll just take turns doing it. Um, there's another great book that that's, I, I, I would say has been the most influential book of, of my entire life, and that's um, Ursula K. Le Guin's uh, The Dispossessed. And that describes an, an alien anarcho-communist society. It's, it's kind of like the utopian. They, they've actually gotten to anarcho-communism in, in its fullest form. Um, there's no hierarchies, no walls in the entire country, all these sorts of things. And the way that they work out these, these jobs that no one really wants to do is they call it 10th day work. So every 10th day, you do you, you, you pick a task out of a hat, or they, they had a computer that assigned people tasks and, and jobs and stuff like that. Um, and then you do it. So that, that could be like uh, waste removal. That could be digging a ditch. It could be anything that, that not enough people will volunteer to do. Um, so that could be another way to work things out. Mm-hmm. It seems like these, like these systems work up to a certain scale. I mean, right. It seems hard. Uh, like if you know everyone by name in your community, yeah, you can be communal. Right. But as soon as you don't, <laughs> that is definitely a huge hard. difficulty. Like, yeah. How do you? How do you? How would you ever extend this out to the scale of? Yeah. say the United States right. or even the United Kingdom you know a very complex and, and large society that still is is only a fraction of, of the population we have here right. and, and maybe we find out that that's not possible maybe we find out that instead we just have very small communities very very small political organizations right. that just have you know mutual aid affinity groups with other such organizations and and there's no such thing as, as a national government mm-hmm everything comes down to the very local level. Right. Um, that makes more sense. Yeah. That makes more sense, but I, I mean, and at the same time, that could be very dangerous because then if things are all, if the power is, is, is so distributed, what happens if a very centralized power comes in from the outside and tries to, to smash it? What do you do? Right. Um, and Kropotkin would say, well, because you've invested the revolution in the people by providing for them, everyone will just naturally fight and, and resist whatever whatever occupying right. force is coming in. I, I think that's not a bad assessment and not a bad uh, outlook or, or expectation to, to put on people. But again, like I mean, even getting to the point where there's enough people to have an entire anarchist society, it's it's hard to imagine. Right. And it, you know, one of the things that Ursula K. Le Guin was was famous for for saying was that it's. It's easier to imagine Armageddon than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But just like the divine right of kings, it, it seems inevitable. It seems eternal. But, but, but like, and I'm mangling the quote, but, but just like kings, that's, that's been shown to be false. Right. We got past, for the most part, uh, uh, a, a sort of feudal system. Yeah. They... they pretty much only exist in name in this in this time of, of the world yeah or in or in very small scale yeah i mean it seems like there are some design flaws of capitalism that will eventually fail <laughs> yeah 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 you know, and um, like just like the it's like a design flaw that blow, that capital concentrates at the top yeah I'm, you need money to make money Right. Oh, and you need people to spend money on your products and services in right. order to keep staying in business. So if you've taken every last cent from them, right, exactly. Where is that going to come from? Yeah. So it seems like I mean that's where it's like nowhere, nowhere in the world is it like purely capitalist, anyways, right? Like every even every economy is, is to one extent or another a mixed economy. And the yeah. and the way that I personally define capitalism is the relationship between owner and worker uh-huh. owner owns the means of production the worker through a contract of employment decides to work from them and give the bulk of of their their um product of their their labor to the owner to yeah. do with what they will uh socialism then comes in and gets rid of this this owner and and 
owner and worker situation and right. says that everything's going to be democratic where every every enterprise now is is run where everyone is a part owner right. everyone collectively makes the big decisions uh, democratically not even sorry. if you just introduced ownership as a function of labor even if you didn't yet go to democratic decision making mm -hmm. i feel like that still make like a huge difference mm -hmm. like if if a part of your like compensation was required to be like shares in the company right like, have some then sort all of, of saying. sudden you're you're an owner right you know even if you you know like if you work at an amazon warehouse and you get a share every quarter or something right you know like yeah. And, it, and it vests over time and like you're you're an, you're an owner but maybe you don't I mean I mean a, a complex organization like Amazon has you don't have controlling shares still yeah exactly yeah. and like there are countless decisions being made every day so you can't possibly weigh in on all of them but like but you should be able to weigh in on the ones that like affect you <laughs> I suppose you know what I mean like yeah that, that, so, would, that would make sense. Yeah, like that would be if you could, if you had a say in like how your, you know, particular warehouse was run or something. But yeah, I do think like that feels like a like we just changed the concept of ownership. Like right now, the system just says, "Hey, if you had the idea, then you own it end to end, no matter what." Like basically, but it's like, well, what about all the people you? convinced to like make your idea a reality mm -hmm. like they're as necessary as you were absolutely so they should probably own some of it as well like right. in exchange for their working for you yeah that would so, make sense yeah and that yeah. just seems like you know what well, and it, it tends to be that you know capitalism goes through these cycles and eventually you know beyond just the boom and bust of like you know i think it was Every seven years, there's there's a major recession, but beyond that, every every once every few generations, there's a huge reset uh, that that has to come through. Things break down to the the such a large point right. that the wheels would just fall off and the whole system would burn if you didn't drastically take control and, and turn things around. That's what happened with the New Deal. There was there was a lot of of, of especially anarchists and, and communists within the United States around the time of the, the Great Depression, who were like, we really need a new way forward. We need more buy-in from, from uh, workers. They, they need to be more enfranchised in every way. You know, the unions need to be stronger, all this stuff. We need to have more direct control over the means of production. And the compromise was what FDR came up with, with the, the, the New Deal, um, instituting social policies like um, Social Security and, and uh, these sorts of things, the worker programs, the, the make work programs, stuff like that. And that was enough to, 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 to stave things off for a while. Um, and then the pendulum swung completely the other way when, right. when Reagan and Thatcher came into power and neoliberalism became the, the, the biggest thing. But that's, that's eaten itself out or eaten itself away so, so long now that people are, are the system is starting to break down again. And, and one way or another, there has to be, I hate to use the term, but a great reset. <laughs> I, know, I know that's going to set all the conspiracy nuts off, but um, there's going to come a time soon where things are just not going to be okay for the average person. And probably what will happen is, is, is the powers that be will make huge concessions of social programs. Maybe it'll be a UBI. Maybe it'll be um, some other sort of social programs. Maybe it'll be more public housing. Who knows? But it, it's not going to be a full... Right. It's not going to be everything that, 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 that a, a true leftist would want, but it's going to be enough to shut up enough people for long enough that they can just keep the, the, the money machine flowing. Right. Um, but, I mean, it can't... I mean, it can't really last forever. Because the other thing about capitalism is you always have to have new people to exploit. You have to have new other countries, foreign countries, uh, to just basically extract as much material, raw material, to make all your goods mm -hmm. and to run all your services that you, that you possibly can. And we're, we're starting to run out of those places. And those places are starting to more and more turn towards leftist ideas 
Um, uh, it's not not B Bolivia is one example. They they've just turned back to the left again after they had ousted Evo Morales and and right. and the right wing government had come in. They they voted them back out and they're back on a leftward path. Peru just voted in an open communist. Um, and it used to be that that the United States had enough power and influence in the world they could just send the CIA in. They could run all these 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 operations to destabilize the governments and, and usually install a right wing dictator at the end of the day. But that seems to be less and less in, as of recently that they're they're able to do that. And people right. just I, and maybe it's it's also because people are just not buying that propaganda who are within the U.S. as much anymore. Right. Maybe, maybe these leftist ideas are penetrating enough that they're saying, hey, yeah, you know, we know this is a CIA operation like you, you you'll see it on facebook or, or twitter or whatever these these people saying i'm a i'm a peruvian and i really hate that a communist is going to come and, and destroy my country and and all this stuff and it's, it's pretty obvious uh, what these operations are so yeah i, I mean like i say it, it it just can't last forever there, ha there has to be some physical limitations because the right. system like you say it just concentrates and concentrates and concentrates eventually there's nothing left at the bottom yeah it's going to bump into many limits. Just like natural limits. Yeah, natural limits. For yeah. Sure. For sure, for sure. Yep. Oh, and I, I see that uh, Ali Osher is in the, the comments. Hello to you. Uh, if you enjoy leftist commentators, especially people that talk about politics a lot, go check out Ali Osher right there. Just click on, on their name and um, sign up for their channel. They, they do a lot of really great work. Cool. Um, and then also Stoop Kid says, isn't jury duty an example of this? Uh, it's been so long since you made that comment that I'm not quite sure what you're asking about. So if you could just, you know, give me a, give me more of a hint about what that is. We'll, we'll get to that comment as well. In the meantime, let's, let's continue on. Let us closely examine the system of remuneration for work done, preached by French, German, English, and Italian collectivists. Spanish anarchists who still call themselves collectivists imply by collectivism the possession in common of all instruments of production and the, quote, liberty of each group to divide the produce as they think fit according to communists or any other principles, end quote. It amounts to this. Everybody works in field, factory, school, hospital, etc. The working day is fixed by the state, which owns lands, factories, roads, etc., Every workday is paid for with a labor note, which is inscribed with these words. A one, one second, though. Uh, so Stoop Kid says the signing people up for certain tasks. Uh, I see. Yeah. Uh, signing people up for certain tasks if there aren't enough people uh, to do said tasks. Yeah, I suppose, I suppose you could call jury duty uh, an example of the 10th day sort of work model of, of assigning jobs that no one wants to do. <laughs> I mean, there's got to be some people out there that just really love being jurors and, you know, so excited to be right. part of the wheels of justice and, and all this stuff. But, I feel like yeah. most people don't. <laughs> don't yeah, like well, it. I mean, yeah. There's, it's there's, also just a crazy system. It is a crazy system. It's, like, it's good in theory, but in practice it makes no sense. Yeah, nine, nine uninformed random people are going right. to dive into the, the complexities of the law. Right. And not bring their biases to it. Right, exactly. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense, yeah. Right. Uh, the empathy lady says, when I was your age, the term consumer was used as a synonym, synonym for citizen by politi uh, politicians and media. Ooh. That's an unfortunate term. Like, <coughs> they still, yeah, use that. Like, consumer yeah. confidence. Consumer is confidence. Consumer <clears throat> confidence is down. What are consumers going to do this season? Yeah, consumer. <laughs> like, like, it, it, is that is that really our highest and best function? Is, is just being a, an open mouth to be stuffed with things? Right. I sure hope not. I sure hope there's more to life than consuming. So yeah, that's that's an unfortunate turn of phrase. <laughs> All right, let's hear more about what these labor notes are. Eight hours work. With this check, the worker can procure all sorts of merchandise in the stores owned by the state or by diverse corporations. The check is divisible so that you can buy an hour's work worth of meat, 10 minutes worth of matches, or half an hour of tobacco. <coughs> After the collectivist revolution, instead of saying two pence worth of soap, we shall say five minutes worth of soap. 
Most collectivists, true to the distinction laid down by middle-class economists and by Marx, between qualified work and simple work, tell us, moreover, that qualified or professional work must be paid a certain quantity more than simple work. Thus an hour's work of a doctor will have to be considered as equivalent to two or three hours' work of a hospital nurse, or to three hours' work of a navvy. <clears throat> Professional or qualified work will be a multiple of simple work, says the collectivist Scranland, because this kind of work needs a more or less long apprenticeship. Other collectivists, such as the... Okay, before we get into other collectivists, so, so what this is sounding like more to me is the idea that we're going to quantify every job by the number of hours they take uh -huh. to do it, and, and, but then also perhaps multiply or add to that the, the level of expertise that the job takes right. and compensate based on that. So, I mean, here we have kind of a, a similar system to a meritocracy where the people that are, have more in-demand skills get compensated better. Um, and and there's, some, there's some problems with that. One, for one thing, how do you quantify how much time it takes to do a given task and 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 how do you take um say the time it does to do a surgery and compare that to the time it does to dig a ditch like one is definitely much more physically strenuous right and the other requires more skill but really which one is more useful to society i it could be that neither are I think that's what we, where we need to, to turn things when we're talking about compensation is, you know, if, if we're going to have any levels of compensation at all, is how useful is this to society as a whole? Right. Um, because then, even someone like a janitor who's keeping a school clean or an office clean, imagine, um, you, can, you can figure out how valuable they are by imagining that they were not part of the equation. People were just left to clean up their own areas. How dirty would things get? How quickly would they get dirty? How much would that slow down work? So on and so on and so on. And then you come to see that the janitor can be just as, as valuable to the, the operations of a large company or a school or whatever as, as the head, you know, as the people making all the decisions about, uh, you know, where the, the company or whatever is going next, what methods are used, all these different things. Mm -hmm. Um... So yeah, so just breaking things down by time seems a bit simplistic. Yeah. Well, yeah. Wait, so is he trying to criticize the labor note thing? Yes, I, I believe he is. Because he wants to do away with, with currency of all forms well, yeah, just cause entirely. Because it, it just sounds like money to me. Yeah, yeah really. <laughs> it's, it's not that far different from That's like the point of, that's money. the point of money in theory, I and, think, is and, to be a representation of value, right. value created. Like, so... That sounds like the same thing, <laughs> right? Yeah. So maybe that's his criticism, I guess. If he's I think also so. I think so. Money, he, right. He's he's, he's saying that this can right. allow these things to creep back in these these right. hierarchies, these uh, stratification of, of societies and, right. and imbalances in power will will creep back in if we allow these sorts of things to happen. Right. I think he has he has a pretty good point. Um, so yeah. yeah. Cool. I missed his criticism of money, so. Okay, yeah, that, that, that was in earlier chapters when he's talking yeah. about the revolution itself, so. You should definitely go back and, and, and check it out. read the rest of this book. It's, <laughs> it's really good. It, it's not that long of a book. Let me, let me look it up real quick to see how long the audiobook version is in its entirety. Uh, let's go to LibriVox. Conquest of bread. Oh, it's not going to say how long it is, is it? Maybe if you click on the link. Yeah. Yeah, not yeah, download, but just the, that. Yeah, let's see. Oh, it's got it. Divided. Oh yeah, so so under seven hours you can get this this entire book covered. So, nice. yeah, if you got a long road trip um, and if you got a commute of any kind, really, you can knock it out in a week or two. Um, I I listened to it while I was delivering packages, and I think it was only a few days that it took to to get through it, and I was you know 
switching back and forth through other stuff at the same time. So, nice. yeah, you can breeze through it. Not too bad. Cool. That's the thing I love about audiobooks too. That's kind of why I, I chose that as, as the format is because you can do it while you're doing other things. Yeah. You know, it doesn't take, you don't have to engage your eyes. Totally. So, cool, cool, cool. Let's see. All right, well, let's continue on. Here's some more about these labor notes. Cool. The French Marxists do not make this distinction. They proclaim equality of wages. The doctor, the schoolmaster, and the professor will be paid in labor checks at the same rate as the Navi. Eight hours visiting the sick in a hospital will be worth the same as eight hours spent in earthworks or else in mines and factories. Some make a greater concession. They admit that disagreeable or unhealthy work, such as sewerage, could be paid for at a higher rate than agreeable work. One hour's work of a sewerman would be worth, they say, two hours of a professor's work. Let us add that certain collectivists admit of corporations paying a lump sum for work done. Thus, the corporation would say, here are a hundred tons of steel. A hundred workmen were required to produce them, and it took them ten days. Their work day being an eight-hour day, it has taken them 8,000 working hours to produce 100 tons of steel, eight hours a ton. For this, the state would pay them 8,000 labor notes of one hour each. And these 8,000 checks would be divided among the members of the ironworks as they themselves thought proper. On the other hand, 100 miners, having taken 20 days to extract 8,000 tons of coal, coal would be worth two hours a ton, and the 16,000 checks of one hour each received by the Guild of Miners would be divided among their members according to their own appreciation. If the miners protested and said that a ton of steel should only cost six hours work instead of eight, if the professor wished to have his day paid twice more than the nurse, then the state would interfere and would settle their differences. Such is, in a few words, the organization collectivists wish to see arise out of the social revolution. So, so I see in, in this sort of a system where everyone's basically compensated by their time. There may be slight variations that the state works out. But, but overall, you know, you give all these, these labor notes to um, a, a collective for, like they said, doing an ironworks, I don't, I don't remember, a miners, whatever, whatever it was they, that he had mentioned. Um, and they divide it how they see fit. There's not, not too much difference between that and the way that a modern um, worker-owned cooperative functions, where you still are using currency, because that's just the system we're in, but people tend to uh, make these sorts of decisions about who gets compensated what, for what rate, that sort of thing, amongst themselves democratically. Mm -hmm. So one, you know, one worker, one share, or, or one controlling share, I should say. Because you can still have cooperatives, too, where you sell shares to the outside, to investors who do not have any sort of say in the operation. These, these are, are non-voting shares, I think is how it's, it's termed. Um, so they can invest in your company. You can get some, some capital investment. At the same time, they don't control anything. And the reason that they would you know, buy stock in your company at all is just on betting on it, it succeeding. You know, it's, it's a bet like any other. Like, if any average person bought a share of, say, Microsoft... It doesn't matter, even if we do have a voting share, we're never going to have a say in the, the, the way that, that Microsoft functions, right. just by having that one share. The reason to do it is to, to speculate that you're going to make money by selling it to someone else at a later time. Right. So you can still have the same thing in a, in a worker-owned cooperative. Um, but I, I guess that's kind of a digression from the, the topic. Anyway, the, the, the point being, this, this seems like a little bit better of a system with the labor notes, but, but still not that far different from, from just using the currency. Right. Um, so what, you know, I'm going to speak for Kropotkin again, just based on, on what he said so far in the book. I think he would say that, that rather than, than just backsliding into a currency and just saying, well, you know, it's, these things are so complex, let's just let's work it out by a system we know that works. Instead, he would say, let's just give people control over whatever business they're a part of now or whatever business will have them. Let them voluntarily associate with, with whoever will have them and say, you know, I got... I got skills as, as a, a, um, a miner, you know, you go and join the miners guild basically. Uh, and then everyone just does their work. And then 
through distribution cooperatives or whatever, the resources get distributed among the local communities and then also traded with neighboring areas, you know, especially like farmers who trade, you know, food for farm equipment, stuff like that. And, the, and you, you'd never just bring, you never bring any sort of currency into it. You just do, you just, you do everything as we do now, we just take money out of the equation. So you would still go to work doing your job. Hopefully you can choose a better job that you, that you like better if you don't currently like the one you're at. Um, but then, you know, like I said, you just, you walk into a store, you get the stuff you want. There's, there's no reason, reason to steal it. You can't really steal anything because you're, mm -hmm. you know, you're not allowing people to hoard things for one thing. If, if someone hoards all the resources for themselves, you, you collectively act against them. Um, but then there's just no reason to. There's, 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 there's no benefit to taking all of the corn for yourself because, well, you're going to need something else. You're going to need some farm equipment to keep on uh, farming that corn. So you might as well just give out what you can to the system, any excess you have of, of any of these products, and just keep things as they are. Just remove money from the equation. It's, it's, it seems like it might be more complex, but I, I think it would end up being just a whole lot simpler and, and you know, better for everyone, really. A lot, a lot less uh, work, a lot, a lot less busy work would, would need to be done, you know, if you, if you are an accountant and your accounting day just happens to be done by noon, you don't have to, you know, play Tetris or whatever on your, on your work <laughs> computer or just cruise your Facebook profile or whatever, you know, do any of these other things to make yourself look busy. You just go home, then, you know, and, and, and unless there's some scenario that happens where well everyone decides you're just a really lousy accountant and and you're just making everyone's life harder and you just need to leave then you know things are just fine and, and things continue to happen as normal really this is the argument of getting rid of money of getting rid of money entirely yeah uh -huh. so, uh, so, so so this is the position that, that Kropotkin holds right as I understand it right just get rid of the money you know People will still make stuff as they do, and things will naturally just be circulated based on need. Mm -hmm. um, and today we could do that a lot better with the, the assistance of computers. You know, just think about how much the, the free section of Craigslist has, has changed the way that people make transactions. You right. know? It would be like everything being on the free page of Craigslist. Right. You know, that could be one system. So, so instead of that, that used couch, it would be like 20 tons of steel or, you know, 3,500 automobiles or something like that. Mm -hmm. and, and people would say, yeah, we need a few over here, a few over there, stuff like that. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It seems hard to grasp. Absolutely. All of these systems moving beyond capitalism, it is, it is really hard to conceptualize. Yeah. I think a, a good way to, to, to start people down that road of conceptualizing it is just imagine how it was growing up, hopefully, for you. Um, if you're part of a family and you need braces, does your dad say you have to go out and, and you know, uh, sell, I don't know, 30 tacos? <laughs> and, or something like that you, you have to sell enough tacos to pay for those braces no they take you to the dentist you get the braces you don't there's no currency exchange between you and your parents you know same thing with food it's not right. as though you have to do a certain number of chores every day to eat um you don't have to do anything to be part of a family you're just part of a family and some kids are lazy and some kids are, are more industrious and some kids just you know haven't been exposed to the right thing yet and you and you, but you you help them. You don't have to threaten them with saying, you know, study harder on your math test or you're going to be out on the street, <laughs> you know, right. or any of these, these things. Kids get shelter. They get medical care. They get clothing. They get all the things that they need for their life just by being a part of the family. So it's just taking that model and extending it to an entire neighborhood or, or a city or an right. entire society right. saying, hey, you are a valid person. You don't have to prove your validity. We trust that 
if you are able to uh, contribute in, in whatever way that you can, that you're going to. And even if you can't, there's enough people that can so that we can get by. Mm -hmm. And there's enough people that just naturally will so that we can get by. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I, like to, I like to try that thought experiment to, you know, get people thinking in that direction. Right. Does that, make, does that make sense or is that kind of... Yeah. <laughs> okay. It sounds great. <laughs> yeah, it does sound great. Okay. I think, yeah, it's skeptical of our ability to do it. Of course, yeah. And, and that's, that's the chief criticism of, of this entire book, this entire work, is it's just, it's a bit too pie in the sky. It's a bit too idealistic. People are just going to take advantage of all, all, the, all these sorts of things. And mm -hmm. I think it, it's fair criticism. Um, I've just I've just come to a different understanding of human nature. I think people will naturally want to contribute whatever they can. Um, you look at projects like uh, like uh, Wikipedia or uh, any of the open source coding mm -hmm. that, that's gone on. Thousands, millions of people have contributed, continue to contribute every day. Right. Um, even things as simple as like a, a Facebook group. Like I, I maintain a couple different Facebook groups. I don't ever expect to be compensated for that. I, I, I would feel kind of weird if I, I was, in fact. I just do it because I, I want to. Um, so that, that just happens to be my thing. But I'm sure everyone has a thing that they can contribute and, and, and just would, right. naturally. I, I, don't, I don't think it's that much of a, a leap when it comes down to it to assume that society would still function without threats and, and complex negotiations and all these sorts of hierarchies that, that people have just come to take for granted. Like, of course I have a boss. How else would I get a job if I didn't have a boss? Well, I mean, there are other ways to do things. Right. So it really just starts with, with changing your frame of mind and, and just imagining that something different is possible, really. Yep. <laughs> cool. All right, let's continue on. Yeah. As we see, their principles are collective property of the instruments of production, and remuneration to each according to the time spent in producing, while taking into account the productivity of his labor. As to the political system, it would be parliamentarianism modified by positive instructions given to those elected by the referendum, a vote taken by nose or eyes by the nation. Let us own that this system appears to us unrealizable. Collectivists begin by proclaiming a revolutionary principle the abolition of private property, then they deny it no sooner than proclaimed by upholding an organization of production and consumption that originated in private property. They proclaim a revolutionary principle and ignore the consequences that this principle will inevitably bring about. They forget that the very fact of abolishing individual property and the instruments of work, land, factories, road, capital, must launch society into absolutely new channels must completely overthrow the present system of production, both in its aim as well as in its means, must modify daily relations between individuals, as soon as land, machinery, and all other instruments of production are considered common property. They say, no private property, and immediately after strive to maintain private property in its daily manifestations. You shall be a commune as far as regards production, fields, tools, machinery, all that has been invented up till now, factories, railways, harbors, mines, etc., are all yours. Not the slightest distinction will be made concerning the share of each in this collective property. But from tomorrow, you will minutely debate the share you are going to take in the creation of new machinery, in the digging of new mines. You will carefully weigh what part of the new produce belongs to you. You will count your minutes of work, and you will take care that a minute of your neighbors cannot buy more than yours. And as an hour measures nothing, as in some factories a worker can see to six power looms at a time, while in another he tends only two, you will weigh the muscular force, the brain energy, and the nervous energy you have expended. You will accurately calculate the years of apprenticeship in order to apprise the amount each will contribute to future production. And this, after having declared that you do not take into account his share in past production. Well, for us, it is evident that a society cannot be based on two absolutely opposed principles. 
two principles that contradict one another continually. And a nation or a commune that would have such an organization would be compelled to revert to private property in the instruments of production, or to transform itself immediately into a communist society. We have said that certain collectivist writers desire that a distinction should be made between qualified or professional work and simple work. They pretend that an hour's work of an engineer, an architect, or a doctor must be considered as two or three hours' work of a blacksmith, a mason, or a hospital nurse. And the same distinction must be made between all sorts of trades, necessitating a more or less long apprenticeship in the simple toil of day laborers. Well, to establish this distinction would be to maintain all the inequalities of present society. It would mean fixing a dividing line from the beginning between the workers and those who pretend to govern them. It would mean dividing society into two very distinct classes. So again, this, this is uh, Kropotkin's rebuttal to the idea of having any, any sort of, of currency at all. Mm -hmm. Just the idea that it reimposes these, these unjustified hierarchies, basically, mm -hmm. when it comes down to it. The aristocracy of knowledge, above the horny-handed lower orders, the ones doomed to serve the other, the one working with its hands to feed and clothe those who, profiting by their leisure, study how to govern their fosterers. It would mean reviving one of the distinct peculiarities of present society and giving it the sanction of the social revolution. It would mean setting up, as a principle, an abuse already condemned in our ancient, crumbling society. We know the answer we shall get. They will speak of scientific socialism. They will quote bourgeois economists and Marx too, to prove that a scale of wages has its raison d'etre as the labor force of the engineer will have cost more to society than the labor force of the navvy. In fact, have not economists tried to prove to us that if an engineer is paid 20 times more than a navvy, it is because the necessary outlay to make an engineer is greater than the necessary to make a navvy? And has not Marx asserted that the same distinction is equally logical between two branches of manual labor. He could not conclude otherwise, having on his own account taken up Ricardo's theory of value and upheld that goods are exchanged in proportion to the quantity of work socially necessary for their production. But we know what to think of this. We know that if engineers, scientists, or doctors are paid 10 or 100 times more than a laborer, and that a weaver earns three times more than an agricultural laborer, and ten times more than a girl in a match factory, it is not by reason of their cost of production, but by reason of a monopoly of education or a monopoly of industry. Engineers, scientists, and doctors merely exploit their capital, their diplomas, as middle-class employers exploit a factory, or as nobles used to exploit their titles of nobility. All right, so a few more comments coming in. Stoop Kid says, I still don't think getting rid of currency would work. Even indigenous people had the currency had a currency system. True. Uh, agreed, maybe in a small community it would work, but no way a, a city scale would work. And those are fair points. That it, It's possible we would have to retain some sort of currency, especially the, as you say, the, the higher up you go in the more and more complex system. And also, especially if not all of your trading partners uh, are part of the same political system that you are. Um, and there, there, there are modern uh, socialists and anarchists who would say, well, okay, what about just for the necessities of life? Those things we, we do away with currency for so that at least everyone can be on an, an equal platform uh, in that regard. And then if you want to have extra luxuries, that's when currency comes back in. You know, your, your extra cool video game system, um, a... a a personal car, perhaps, if, if we're in a, a city and, and that becomes the, the least uh, dominant form of transportation. Stuff like that. Maybe we could have currency for, for just the, the, the extras of life. So there's different ways to conceive of it. And, and, and that's absolutely true. It, it could be that we just never completely do away with currency altogether. And I would say that that's okay as long as we can keep moving towards 
a more and more egalitarian society where everyone can reach their potential and everyone has their basic needs met. So if we can, if we can balance those two things, then I would be uh, okay with, with retaining at least some form of currency. Yeah, it seems like his argument is that currency of any kind creates a hierarchy. Right. And hierarchy of any kind is not okay. Right. It's not cool. And and to a certain extent that's true. Like like we don't we don't want people hoarding power or resources or anything that they could use to hold the rest of their society captive. Mm-hmm. We don't want people like Bill Gates or or Elon Musk to be possible right. in a system. That's just hoarding too much. That's having too much influence. Think about even the 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 influence that Jeff Bezos has on the media owning the is it the Washington Times or is it the Post? Post. The Post. The Washington Post. They're never going to say a critical thing about Amazon because any reporter that did would lose their job immediately. Right. So already that's an undue influence on society. Think about all the, the money that goes into political ads, even at the local level. Um, well, maybe probably not the local level unless you're in a really large city like Chicago, New York. Like, I don't think I... Pretty, I, don't, I, I don't remember re- seeing any ads for like uh, our, our mayor, Melvin Carter, mayor of St. Paul. But, 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 you know, think of all the money that goes into political ca- campaigns is what I'm saying. Right. That's, out, that's outsized influence. There needs to be a way to at least rein that, that extreme excess in. While at the same time bringing up the bottom so that no one is struggling to survive. Everyone has their basic needs met. Um, as long as we can get within that window, that's that's a, a order of magnitude better society than we have today. And I would call that, I mean, if that happens within my lifetime, I would call it a success, no matter what the, the political term for it is or, or, or how it's analyzed. If we can get to that point where everyone is within that window, not so little that you're struggling and feel like you can't stop working for even a day or else you're just going to fall flat on your face and be in debt forever, not so much that you can say which way society goes based on a pen stroke or, or the right check written to the right politician. As long as we're within in that window, yeah, man, I would be so happy if we got to that, mm-hmm. that level within my lifetime. Right. And maybe it's not even possible within our lifetimes. Maybe this is something for, you know, grandkids, great grandkids, so on and so on. Maybe it's just future generations that, that will finally get to that chance. But it starts with at least having these conversations. Right, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. It's sort of like... I think it's good for all of us to imagine different systems. That's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we just kind of accept the systems that we are told are the way things are, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I guess. So it's like good to imagine different systems. It's also like good to think about like what's next practical step to, absolutely you know yeah i don't think there's anything inherently wrong about incrementalism saying what can we do next what can how can we make things just a little bit better right uh, again you have to temper it with the urgency of things like climate change and just well, complete sure. ecosystem shutdown yeah and, i mean i think things will probably collapse and that stinks but it's, well, it's gonna take. <laughs> yeah that stinks <laughs> <laughs> well i mean just humans don't have a good track record of like maintaining things forever long term thinking having forethought yeah (laughs) more or less and yeah I think capitalism really even focuses that beam of attention even further it's it's to the point where it seems inevitable it's not good I don't want that to happen obviously but like it just seems inevitable yeah yeah. but even then like I think like a collapse wouldn't obviously it wouldn't reorganize society to the point that we all live in like small moneyless communes probably unless the collapse was so great you know you that, know I, like we lost a significant portion of the population or something right. and like whole uh, yeah thing whole industry shut down and like all that but like short of that like it seems like even a collapse would probably be like more what you're saying like another new deal or something like right you know those would be the ways that we like well, and, move forward and, and in addition um, I mean we're already seeing climate refugees around the world right and surprise surprise it's not the wealthiest nations that are being impacted first right so 
in any sort of a, a, a ecosystem collapse, any sort of a, a climate change catastrophe, it's going to be the people that are in the worst position right now who are going to be the first to right. move or perish, really. Right. I mean, if, yeah. it, if it comes to the point where the the equator, the, the tropics are, are emptying out of people because it's just too brutally hot. I mean, there's a heat wave right now in the Middle East where temperatures are getting up to 50 degrees Celsius, which I looked up is 120 Fahrenheit. Yeah. And, and a temperature I cannot imagine. Yeah. I think that the hottest I've ever experienced was like 110, right yeah. around that range. 120 in in early or in, in late spring, early summer. That's it's it, they're setting records. Yeah. Um, so if it comes to the point where where people are being squeezed out, I hate to say, it, but I th- I think it is going to be the the those people that feel the brunt of it first, and it's going to be the wealthier places, and then within. Countries like the U.S., it's going to be the wealthier cities that, that marshal their resources to maintain what, they, what they're doing longer, you know, the longest of anybody. Mm-hmm. They'll be the last holdouts. Um, right. It doesn't have to be that way, though. You know? Right. Right. You could try something else. Um, so Stu, Stu Kid says even a labor note is currency. Yeah, and, and that's exactly what, what Kropotkin was criticizing. He doesn't even want to have labor notes. He wants to have people just keep on producing and then just distribute by whatever system naturally arises uh, all the goods and services. Empathy Lady says there are so many jobs and professions. Human society is so complex. Absolutely true. Uh, what about entertainers, sports figures, artists, chefs, and a thousand other jobs? What about uh, people who would want to do something but aren't good at it? This is a hugely complicated issue, and, and, and it, it certainly is. Um, when, you, when you think about uh, what books like uh, The Dispossessed would say about that is people that, that didn't fit in with whatever guild they were assigned to. like The, the way that the, the, the economy, if you even want to call it that, worked for these people in this in in the dispossessed was they would use a computer and it would assign you to a job um based somewhat on your qualifications based also on just where the need is greatest and it might be in a different part of the country you might have to move uh they they they, the society they talked about people moved around a lot because it was a very resource poor place that they lived they were basically given this planet's moon which, which had an atmosphere and a little bit of water, but, but not a whole lot else. And they, they had to make do with, with very little. Um, so what they would say was that if someone just wasn't fitting in with whatever guild they were assigned to, the people would get together and they would, I mean, they, they did it in kind of a passive aggressive way. They would, you know, if you were making a big stink in whatever place you, you happen to be living or working, they would just take your name off of the, the food rations for the night you know to let you know hey you're not welcome here anymore and you just have to move on to somewhere else and you know it wasn't a big deal they would just assign you a different job you go to a different place and, and hopefully fit in better and then they also did the, the the tenth day work things but they would also rotate people through various jobs a lot um and that's a way that you can do it um thinking back to to bullshit jobs again david graber was talking about a company where it was a worker-owned cooperative so they made all their decisions together. And there was one employee, I don't remember what the job was, but they were really crap at it. Maybe it was like marketing or something like that. Um, and they got together with the other employees, all, all the employees got together to finally address it because it was just, it was slowing everyone else down. It was, it was hurting their work and their productivity. And after hashing things out, they didn't, they didn't threaten to fire the, the guy. They didn't, uh, bust him down to a lower position. They didn't punish him in any way. What they ended up figuring out was that he just didn't like that particular position. He wanted to do something different. And, it, and as it happens, there was someone else, maybe it was engineering or something, who they weren't really happy with their job. And so they agreed to just switch. And then the productivity of both of them went sky high. And it's not as though either one of them necessarily thought, hey, uh, man, I really wish I was, uh, I was doing this other job and I hate it. But because they were given the opportunity to just try, uh, things worked out a lot better. So that could be another way that, that things could be handled. If things aren't working out for you, you don't necessarily get to keep doing it, but 
we work then collectively to help fit you in better somewhere else. You know, instead of just kicking you out on the streets and saying, you know, so long, you, you sort your, your life out or, or get your motivation going or whatever, we work together and say, hey, the problem's probably just that this is a bad fit for you. Let's find some place where you fit in better. Um, so yeah, I mean, how many people hate their job today? How many people would love to do a different job? I, I like my job a, a fair amount, uh, but there's definitely other jobs I would like more. And it'd be great if I could have that opportunity um, and a society that was that was behind me and, and wanting me to succeed in that. So, so yeah, it's complex, but I, I don't think it's completely unmanageable. Um, I'm sure if you described our modern society to someone that lived back in or, or someone that came from a tribal tradition, they would just be overwhelmed. They wouldn't be able to. And it's not through anything, anything lacking in them. It's just their frame of reference would be so totally different that they couldn't imagine it. Um, and it would be hard for them to then just be thrown into a, a modern city or whatever and, and survive. You know, it, would, it would just be an overwhelming of, of their experience. Um, the same could be true about this sort of next form of society that we're talking about. But that doesn't mean we can't get there. That doesn't mean that we can't edge up to it or, or ease up to it. Um, let's see. I think we should work on making monetary society work better since uh, that's achievable in the short term. I would absolutely agree with you, stupid kid. Uh, I think Richard Wolff, uh, this, this famous, I think he's Harvard economist, um, his big thing is, is getting, he calls them worker self-directed enterprises. It's kind of a nuanced thing. It's, it's basically worker-owned cooperatives. You have Everyone, including the management, in, in, including um, support positions, people that are not directly doing things, so people like HR, people like finance, stuff like that, people that don't make the product or service, all of them make these decisions collectively about compensation, about um, what authority each position has, the, the working conditions and the hours, on and on and on and on. Um, that is something we can do right now. and. In his definition of, of socialism, that qualifies because you've taken apart the, the dominant and subordinate relationship that every other system back throughout history, whether it's capitalism with the owner and worker, whether it's feudalism with the lord and serf, whether it's slavery with the master and, and slave, um, back, 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 and back. All these ones include exploiter and exploited. So by moving to socialism, that means doing away with exploiter-exploited relationships where everyone is the worker and everyone collectively makes decisions. So that is something we can do right now. That is, that is a way that we can um, get towards a more egalitarian society. I see we're taking a long time on, on this chapter. <laughs> um, do you have any time constraints tonight? No. Okay, okay. Yeah. Just, just wanted to make sure. Yeah. We should probably try and speed it up, though. But did you have any thoughts on that before we move no, on? No, let's keep, let's okay, keep, let's, keep let's keep it rolling. That sounds good. As to the employer who pays an engineer 20 times more than a laborer, it is simply due to personal interest. If the engineer can economize 4,000 pounds a year on the cost of production, the employer pays him 800 pounds. And if the employer has a foreman who saves 400 pounds on the work by cleverly sweating workmen, he gladly gives him 80 pounds or 120 pounds a year. He parts with an extra 40 pounds when he expects to gain 400 by it. And this is the essence of the capitalist system. The same differences obtain among diverse manual trades. Let them therefore not talk to us of the cost of production which raises the cost of skilled labor and tell us that a student who has gaily spent his youth in a university has a right to a wage ten times greater than the son of a miner who has grown pale in a mine since the age of eleven, or that a weaver has a right to a wage three or four times greater than that of an agricultural laborer. The cost of teaching a weaver his work is not four times greater than the cost of teaching a peasant his. The weaver simply benefits by the advantages his industry reaps in Europe in comparison with countries that have as yet no industries. Nobody has ever calculated the costs of production, and if a loafer costs far more to society than a worker, 
It remains to be seen whether a robust day laborer does not cost more to society than a skilled artisan. When we have taken into account infant mortality among the poor, the ravages of anemia, and premature deaths. Could they, for example, make us believe that the one shilling three pence paid to a Paris workman, the three pence paid to an Auvergne peasant girl who grows blind at lace making, or the one shilling eight pence paid to the peasant represent their cost of production? We know full well that people work for less, but we also know that they do so exclusively because, thanks to our wonderful organization, they would die of hunger did they not accept these mock wages. For us, the scale of remuneration is a complex result of taxes, of governmental tutelage, of capitalist monopoly, in a word, of state and capital. Therefore, we say that all wage theories have been invented after the event to justify injustices at present existing, and that we need not take them into consideration. Neither will they fail to tell us that the collectivist scale of wages would be an improvement. It would be better, so they say, to see certain artisans receiving a wage two or three times higher than common laborers, than to see a minister receiving in a day what a workman cannot earn in a year. It would be a great step toward equality. For us, this step would be the reverse of progress. To make a distinction between simple and professional work in a new society, would result in the revolution sanctioning and recognizing as a principle, a brutal fact we submit to nowadays, but that we nevertheless find unjust. It would mean imitating those gentlemen of the French Assembly who proclaimed August 4, 1789, the abolition of feudal rights, but who, on August 8, sanctioned these same rights by imposing dues on the peasants to compensate the noblemen, placing these dues under the protection of the revolution. It would mean imitating the Russian government, which proclaimed, at the time of the emancipation of the serfs, that the lands should henceforth belong to the nobility, while formerly the lands were considered belonging to the serfs. Or else, to take a better known example, when the Commune of 1871 decided to pay members of the Commune Council 12 shillings 6 pence a day, while the Federates on the ramparts received only 1 shilling 3 pence, this decision was hailed as an act of superior democratic equality. In reality, the commune only ratified the former inequality between functionary and soldier, government and govern. Coming from an opportunist chamber of deputies, such a decision would have appeared admirable, but the commune doomed her revolutionary principles because she failed to put them into practice. Under our existing social system, when a minister gets paid 4,000 pounds a year, while a workman must content himself with 40 pounds or less, when a foreman is paid two or three times more than a workman, and among workmen there is every gradation, from eight shillings a day down to the peasant girl's three pence, we disapprove of the high salary of the minister, as well as of the difference between the eight shillings of the workman and the three pence of the poor woman. And we say, down with the privileges of education as well as with those of birth, we are anarchists precisely because these privileges revolt us. They revolt us already in this authoritarian society. Could we endure them in a society that began by proclaiming equality? Okay. So a lot of thoughts to unpack there. Basically what, he's, what, what I see him saying in this, this last long passage here is that what we don't want is to just recodify differences based on basically the lottery of birth, you know, which which affects things like the education that is accessible to you, um, or the the opportunities that you have, the connections that you make, um, and and he he believes that by having a hierarchy of compensation, we are just solidifying that. <sighs> I do kind of tend to see more the, the, the side that says, well, at least this is progress. Um, I don't think that necessarily it's going to be the best route to just take an all or nothing approach where either we do away with all indifferences or with, with all inequality or we don't try anything. And, and also there is no such thing as the end of history. So even if we get to a point where things are a lot better for a lot of people, uh, that doesn't mean that we have to stop there. We can still continue dreaming beyond that boundary. We can continue improving society. 
um, even even countries or, or nations that, that, that last for hundreds or thousands of years, eventually they crumble. Eventually something new takes over. Eventually the U.S. will be dust as, as a, a legal and political entity. So just saying that because it's not absolutely the best it could be, that, we, that it's not worth trying, I don't necessarily agree with that myself. But I can see what he's saying. I can, I can see what he's saying is what we need, a complete reorientation of how we value people, not by what they've been granted in life, but just because they are people. They are fellow, fellow humans right. on the earth. Yeah, I think that makes sense, for sure, right? Mm -hmm. That's a good, that's just like a moral statement. I yeah, absolutely. Say. Yeah, I think that's a good moral statement. Yeah. It seems like he was trying to say that we shouldn't compensate more for educated work mm -hmm. because education is a privilege or something, basically? Yeah, yeah, basically. It seems like the other way to approach that is make education like free and available for everyone like absolutely that seems like the more positive approach doesn't for it? sure like although you do get into some some pitfalls of of a meritocracy where even if we had a pure meritocracy the most skilled the most educated were compensated the best that still leaves behind a large chunk of people who through no fault of their own necessarily just happen to not be good at or 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 able to get those those positions i mean there's just going to be uh, right. a certain number of those positions available in the first place like when you talk about educated positions that tends to be things like you know management or ownership or the, these higher rungs and and we're still then conceiving of society in pyramidal forms where you still have that that elite echelon at the top which maybe they've earned their spot but but still there's a very few that that get compensated a lot better than the people at the bottom and, and that devalues the contribution of the people who just don't, for whatever reason, don't have the education uh, mm -hmm. or the training or the, the expertise or experience or whatever it is. Sure. So you still end up with an unequal society. Was the, I mean, what, so then do we just pay everyone the same wage no matter what? Well, I mean, he would say we just do away with wages altogether right. and, and just give people whatever they need. Right. Um, in more modern terms, at first, we give everyone in a company an equal say. We start by leveling the playing field there. Right. Um, and then, you know, just because you have a democratic vote to, to about compensation doesn't mean you're not necessarily going to say, oh, yeah, so-and-so, they, they really work hard for our team, and we'd like to, to compensate them a little bit better. Um, you know, this position, it really takes a lot of, of intense work. Let's compensate that a little bit better. But it's at, at least arrived at through, through a democratic process, and it can be reversed if people change their mind. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, like, tough to give everyone a say in everything in an organization, right? It, it, take, it takes more time than, than most people are, are used to giving. Well, but also, like, if you have a certain role in an organization, you are probably trained to do that role, and therefore you have more information mm -hmm. than someone on a different team who has a different specialty. Mm -hmm. And therefore, your vote actually should probably be weighted more because you have more... It depends on what you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, if you're talking about, like, um, I don't know, what vendor should we use for a particular product? Well, that's not necessarily something that would come up for a vote for everybody. Yeah. But if it's for how should people be compensated, what should the working conditions be, what should we do with our, our excess profit, how should we distribute that? Right. These are things I think that anyone can have a say in. Everyone can have enough expertise if they're part of the company to be able to make a decision about that. But it wouldn't be like every single, it's not like, you know, right. you're not going to call up every member of the, the mm -hmm. company and say, hey, can I, can I make a, a trade partnership with company X? Right. You know, if you're the buyer for whatever right. company you work for, you just get to do that work. So right. we're not talking about making every decision right. democratically um, concerned. 
Right. Just the big stuff, the broad stuff, the stuff that really affects your bottom line as an employee. Mm-hmm. Right. It's interesting. Yeah. I guess I'm like, if, if the workers, if, if everyone gets a vote on compensation, mm-hmm. wouldn't everybody just vote to, I want to be paid the most? <laughs> I mean, it could, it, in theory, it could work out that way. I don't think that is how it works out in practice. Yeah. And if everyone said, I want to be compensated the most, well, I mean, the default is then the average compensation goes to everybody, right? Right. Well, that's probably what would happen. <laughs> yeah. I would bet. Yeah. And then people would have no different... going to say, pay me less. Well, it wouldn't necessarily be pay me less, or it might be more like, you know, pay this particular position more. Um, yeah not your own maybe not necessarily your own yeah. you know if, if you have a lot of respect and reverence for a particular manager or, or, or you know even even the janitor maybe maybe you as an organization really appreciate the work of the janitor they've, they've done outstanding work um, they go above and beyond whatever whatever and they say hey Let's, let's come say them all. I'd say that is a distinct possibility. Mm-hmm. Right. And another factor, too, is that if you have um, control over the, where the profit goes, every single employee in that, that company has an incentive for that, that, that company to, I mean, they have a personal incentive for that company to succeed, you know? If, if you're just, a, say, a, a, a target cashier and you're being told you have to push the target card on everyone that comes to that line and if you don't make a certain number of target card right. sales, you're, you're going to get a bad review, enough bad reviews, you're going to get fired. I mean, the, their only incentive then is to not get fired. Right. If, on the other hand, you knew that, that you were going to have a say in, in where that money from that target card came from, you're just going to be like, hey, you should, you should get a target card. You know, every, everyone that comes through, you, you have a, a, a very causal link between you doing more for your job and getting compensated more in the end, too. It, 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 it builds buy-in. Um, right. And you can look at the way that, that, that worker-owned cooperatives have traditionally function because there are, there are plenty of examples around the world of worker-owned cooperatives. The biggest one being uh, the Mondragon Corporation, which right. is... Are you familiar with I them? I feel like I've heard about yeah. it. Yeah. They're, they're out of Spain. They're, they're one of the... I think they're the fifth largest company in, in the country. And they're basically a confederation of, of hundreds of different smaller worker-owned cooperatives. And if you look at the compensation, not everyone's compensated the same, but, but because there's that element of democracy in there, the, the highest paid employee is, is, many, is, is not as many times more compensated than the lowest paid employee, sometimes by, by their own charter, by their own rules that they've built into their cooperative, but just also because, you know, the, the person at the top can't just say, I get the most. Yeah. So. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, Definitely. You could see people being selfish, but I think overall, people get it. You know, they, they, they <laughs> if they feel like they, they have more buy into a particular company, they're going to feel more goodwill towards their fellow employees. Um, so they're not going to want them to get screwed over. Um, and I, I, I think things do and would, can, you know, continue to just basically work themselves out. At least, at least in a more fair way than, than they do now. Mm-hmm. Right. Cool. That is why some collectivists, understanding the impossibility of maintaining a scale of wages in a society inspired by the breath of the revolution, hasten to proclaim equality of wage. But they meet with new difficulties, and their equality of wages becomes the same unrealizable utopia as the scale of wages of other collectivists. A society having taken possession of all social wealth, having boldly proclaimed the right of all to this wealth, whatever share they may have taken in producing it, will be compelled to abandon any system of wages 
whether in currency or labor notes. The collectivists say, to each according to his deeds, or in other terms, according to his share of services rendered to society. They think it expedient to put this principle into practice as soon as the social revolution will have made all instruments of production common property. But we think that if the social revolution had the misfortune of proclaiming such a principle, it would mean its necessary failure. It would mean leaving the social problem, which past centuries have burdened us with, unsolved. In fact, in a society like ours, in which the more a man works, the less he is remunerated, this principle at first sight may appear to be a yearning for justice. But it is really only the perpetuation of past injustice. It was by virtue of this principle that waged and began to end in the glaring inequalities and all the abominations of present society because, from the moment work done was apprised in currency or in any other form of wage, the day it was agreed upon that man would only receive the wage he could secure to himself, the whole history of state-aided capitalist society was as good as written. It germinated in this principle. Shall we then return to our starting point and go through the same evolution again? Our theorists desire it, but fortunately it is impossible. The revolution will be communist, if not, it will be drowned in blood and have to be begun over again. Services rendered to society, be they work in factory or field, or mental services, cannot be valued in money. There can be no exact measure of value, of what has been wrongly termed exchange value, nor of use value, with regard to production. If two individuals work for the community five hours a day, year in, year out, a different work which is equally agreeable to them, we may say that on the whole their labor is equivalent, but we cannot divide their work and say that the result of any particular day, hour, or minute of work of the one is worth the result of the minute or hour of the other. We may roughly say that the man who, during his lifetime, has deprived himself of leisure during ten hours a day has given far more to society than the one who has only deprived himself of leisure during five hours a day or who has not deprived himself at all. But we cannot take what he has done during two hours and say that the yield is worth twice as much as the yield of another individual, working only one hour, and remunerate him in proportion. It would be disregarding all that is complex in industry and agriculture in the whole life of present society. It would be ignoring to what extent all individual work is the result of past and present labor of society as a whole. It would mean believing ourselves to be living in the Stone Age, whereas we were living in an age of steel. If you enter a coal mine, you will see a man in charge of a huge machine that raises and lowers a cage. In his hands, he holds a lever that stops and reverses the course of the machine. He lowers it, and the cage turns back in the twinkling of an eye. He raises it, he lowers it again with a giddy swiftness. All attention he follows with his eyes fixed on the wall, an indicator that shows him, on a small scale, at which point of the shaft the cage is at each second of its progress. As soon as the indicator has reached a certain level, he suddenly stops the course of the cage, not a yard higher nor lower than the required spot, and no sooner have the colliers loaded their coal wagons and pushed empty ones instead. Then he reverses the lever and again sends the cage back into space. During eight or ten consecutive hours, he must pay the closest attention. Should his brain relax for a moment, the cage would inevitably strike against the gear, break its wheels, snap the rope, crush men, and obstruct work in the mine. Should he waste three seconds at each touch of the lever, in our modern perfected mines, the extraction would be reduced from twenty to fifty tons a day. Is it he who is of greatest use in the mine? Or is it perhaps the boy who signals to him from below to raise the cage? Is it the miner at the bottom of the shaft, who risks his life every instant, and who will some day be killed by fire damp? Or is it the engineer, who would lose the layer of coal, and who would cause the miners to dig on rock by a simple mistake in his calculations? And lastly, is it the mine owner who has put all his capital into the mine, and who has, perhaps, contrary to expert advice, asserted that excellent coal would be found there. All
So he's trying to divorce the idea of of compensation with you know quality of, of, of the work done or, or what job is being done. He's saying basically, if every if every of the parts are needed, you can't take apart any one of them and have the whole thing keep on functioning. How can you then compensate people differently? Basically, right. If everyone's necessary, how could everyone not be paid the same? Mm, right. With his, his basic thesis there. It's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, everyone at McDonald's mm-hmm. is necessary for that Absolutely. burger to get there. Right. For for sure. So did they all get paid the same? Uh, I mean, they should at least take a vote on it. I would say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's. I think the maybe the point is that it's just hard to. It's almost yeah, almost like after like a certain point, compensation isn't necessarily directly tied to. Oh, and that's absolutely true. Value, created. especially when you get to the the ownership level, yeah. And, yeah. and that sort of thing. I mean, that's certainly true. Yeah. I, I think basically what he's trying to say is instead of looking at, you know, fairness of, of compensation of this or that or the other thing, the important thing to keep in mind is that we are all in this endeavor together. We are all working towards the end, so we all deserve to have as good of lives as possible, basically. We all deserve to have the basics of life plus, plus time and, and ability for our own right. pursuits. So. Right. So it's kind of flipping things on its on its head a little bit from right. the way you know, we try to quantify you know the value of this person, the value of that person, um, right to the point where like you know even microseconds are, are calculated per per unit of value created. Right. Well, let's see what else. Oh, uh, let's see. Perennial Green says, in consideration of the treatment of workers, positive rewards uh, work far better than threatening someone's job. Yeah, I would say that's absolutely true because you're not then adding the stress of, oh, no, what if I don't perform well, which can often make people not perform well. Uh, Instead, you're saying, we are a team. We are collectively going to do better. And you will see the results of that compensation directly. If, if nothing else, then the, the idea that you will get to have a say in where that compensation goes and how it's distributed. So yeah, I would agree. Positive rewards are better. Uh, would manager roles be unnecessary? No, they would not be unnecessary. Even in, in worker-owned cooperatives, you still have management. You just don't have an owner class. You don't have the board of directors or a CEO. All the workers act as the collective CEOs and board of directors for whatever enterprise they have. But you, you still need support work. Um, in, in, in like Marx and Kropotkin's time, they were called unproductive labor. But I think that's kind of a bad way of, of putting it. You know, they, they still contribute to the enterprise, just not directly. They're not the direct salesperson. They're not the direct laborer. But they're things like accountants, managers, uh, HR people other people that are essential to the functioning of a company that just don't directly do the, the, the good or the, they don't directly produce the good or the service that's, that's needed. So in a worker-owned cooperative, even the managers though, even the, these support people, these, these various support staff roles, they still get the same say as, as every worker who is out there in a, in a mine or, or, or you know, performing a landscaping service or what have you. They collectively work as, as, a, as a company. But yes, you still have managers just because, you know, the, for one thing, that's going to be some people's skills more than others. Uh, and, and for another, just to divide up work um, and divide up positions and, and have, you're still going to have some level of specialization in any organization. You'll have different people perhaps ringing at a register than are preparing food, you know, stuff like that. It just, it, for efficiency's sake, you can't have everyone doing every single position all at once. You may rotate people around. Maybe 
you know, in fact, a, a good cooperative would do that. They would they would just naturally rotate people through as many positions as they could, just on the off chance that something really clicks with them. And and at the very least, they build empathy towards people that are in that role. So in, instead of just assuming you know the motivations of, of your manager or, assume, or a manager assuming they know the motivations of the, the lower workers that are beneath them, they actually get to see and, and, and spend a longer time doing that role so that they know better where they're coming from. It, it just makes things flow a lot better. But yeah, you still have division of work. Let's see what else we got. Uh, because people who have to do longer hours are usually managers. That's true. Uh, but that's something that you would come up with collectively, you know, number of hours worked. Uh, everyone may be on salary, you know, you, you may just be expected to put in a minimum of, of you know, well, however many hours. But you may find out that really when it comes down to it, if you take uh, all the, the busy work and the, the making yourself look busy, that the average number of hours is, is a lot less. Uh, than it otherwise would have been. Um, so there's that as well. Or owners or people who have to keep the company running. So you, you would have owners in that everyone would be an owner in a worker-owned cooperative. Uh, but there's no special separated tier of ownership. That, that's the main difference. Everyone becomes an owner within an organization. Um, yeah, I hope that, that answers your questions. Do you have anything you want to add to that? Or no. Questions or Let's keep going. keep going. All the miners engaged in this mine contribute to the extraction of coal in proportion to their strength, their energy, their knowledge, their intelligence, and their skill. And we may say that all have the right to live, to satisfy their needs and even their whims, when the necessaries of life have been secured for all. But how can we apprise their work? And moreover, is the coal they have extracted their work? Is it not also the work of men who have built the railway leading to the mine and the roads that radiate from all its stations? Is it not also the work of those that have tilled and sown the fields, extracted iron, cut woods in the forests, built the machines that burn coal, and so on? No distinction can be drawn between the work of each man. Measuring the work by its results leads us to absurdity. Dividing and measuring them by hours spent on the work also leads us to absurdity. One thing remains. Put the needs above the works, and first of all recognize the right to live, and later on to the comforts of life for all those who take their share in production. But take any other branch of human activity. Take the manifestations of life as a whole. Which one of us can claim the higher remuneration for his work? Is it the doctor who has found out the illness, or the nurse who has brought about recovery by her hygienic care? Is it the inventor of the first steam engine? Or the boy who, one day getting tired of pulling the rope that formerly opened the valve to let steam enter under the piston, tied the rope to the lever of the machine, without suspecting that he had invented the essential mechanical part of all modern machinery, the automatic valve. And that's another important component to all of this talk of, of how do we compensate people um, based on a set of skills or, or education. Uh, are you going to go back even further and compensate the, the professors, the teachers of, of the more educated person? Probably not. They're not going to be in that, that equation at all. Are you going to go back throughout history and, and look at all the different chain of people who have invented things that, that have all been necessary to make your particular business workable? Are you going to compensate them? I mean, they're, they're still part of, of, of that effort in a large way. Um, and the idea is that we are all, we all should be inheritors of, of, of the, the wealth of information that's been built up, the wealth of knowledge and skill that's been built up throughout the ages. Uh, we are all do that. It, it shouldn't just go to the, the very few who happen to be in, in privileged positions. It should go to everybody. So it's just one more component of the argument of, of compensating people more or less equally. Is it the inventor of the locomotive, or the workman of Newcastle, who suggested replacing the stones formerly laid under the rails by wooden sleepers, as the stones, for want of elasticity, caused the trains to derail? Is it the engineer on the locomotive, the signalman who can stop trains, the switchman who transfers a train from one line to another, 
To whom do we owe the transatlantic cable? Is it to the engineer who obstinately affirmed that the cable would transmit messages when learned electricians declared it to be impossible? Is it to Maury, the scientist who advised that thick cables should be set aside for others as thin as canes? Or else to those volunteers come from nobody knows where, who spent their days and nights on deck minutely examining every yard of the cable and removed the nails that the stockholders of steamship companies stupidly caused to be driven into the non-conducting wrapper of the cable so as to make it unserviceable. And in a wider sphere, the true sphere of life, with its joys, its sufferings, and its accidents, cannot each one of us recall someone who has rendered him so great a service that we should be indignant if its equivalent in coin were mentioned. The service may have been but a word, nothing but a word spoken at the right time, or else it may have been months and years of devotion, and are we going to apprise these incalculable services in labor notes? The works of each, but human society would not exist for more than two consecutive generations if everyone did not give infinitely more than that for which he is paid in coin, in checks, or in civic rewards. The race would soon become extinct if mothers did not sacrifice their lives to take care of their children, if men did not give all the time without demanding an equivalent, if men did not give just to those from whom they expect no reward. If middle-class society is decaying, if we have got into a blind alley from which we cannot emerge without attacking past institutions with torch and hatchet, it is precisely because we have calculated too much. It is because we have let ourselves be influenced into giving only to receive. It is because we have aimed at turning society into a commercial company based on debit and credit. Collectivists know this. They vaguely understand that a society could not exist if it carried out the principle of each according to his deeds. They have a notion that necessaries, we do not speak of whims, the needs of the individual do not always correspond to his works. Thus to Pape tells us, thus to Pape he tells us, the principle, the eminently individualist principle, would, however, be tempered by social intervention, for the education of children and young persons, including maintenance and lodging, and by the social organization for assisting the infirm and the sick, for retreats for aged workers, etc. They understand that a man of forty, father of three children, has other needs than a young man of twenty. They know that the woman who suckles her infant and spends sleepless nights at its bedside cannot do as much work as the man who has slept peacefully. They seem to take in that men and women, worn out maybe by dint of overwork for society, may be incapable of doing as much work as those who have spent their time leisurely and pocketed their labor notes in the privileged career of state functionaries. So here's another wrinkle in the, the idea of compensating people only based on, on the work that they do. As, as, as he was laying out, uh, mothers perform all, all sorts of labor as well as, as stay-at-home fathers, uh, potentially grandparents. A lot of people go into the, the, the raising and care of, of children. That's not a, a, a job in, in the sense of it's not participating in the economy uh, in any direct way, but it's still something that we should value as a society, right? Um, how do you then compensate them? What about people that have a, a disability? That, that prevents them from doing what would traditionally be considered work. Uh, what about people that are just due to old age? Um, no longer can, can perform the, the sort of labor that they used to. Uh, these things complicate the idea of, of compensating just based on merit. Um, yeah, it feels like the argument for UBI, right? Yeah, That's yeah. So, so, so that, that, that is what, what a, right, a, a centralized... Um, <clears throat> government would probably say then as well in these ex in these right. special cases you, you treat them differently or just yeah yeah ubi right yeah yeah, yeah. 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 so you give them extra compensation or or it could just be like free daycare free pre-k um daycare um free housing and and, and meals and, and everything for the elderly the infirmed the disabled that sort of thing. Yeah. So there are other other ways of, of coming at it, but you know, I mean, what what he's driving at is the, why are we making special cases for these people? How how can we can see that these people still have value, but 
but then when it comes to the people that are working, how come they have different value? You know, where, where's the connection there? Right. How can we then turn around and say, well, since you are able to work, you are able to be a miner or, or a laborer of some kind, that we're going to then treat you differently than we would if, if you weren't able to do any of that. Right. So, yeah, the point is everyone has an, should have inherent value in society. It should be seen as them having inherent value. Um, more or less the same, you know, maybe some, uh, some small differences. And, 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 and as, I, as I keep saying, in, in my ideal society, sure, there might, there might be some differences in, in compensation um, based on one thing or another. Uh, and as long as it didn't get to the point where it's destabilizing society, uh, either by, you know, letting people fall through the cracks and, and starve, or by hoarding enough wealth to, to do out, you know, have outsized influence, you know, big deal. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have much of a problem with that particular. But I, I know Kropotkin. He's, he's very much on the idea that we all have to be on the same level because we all deserve about the same, mm-hmm. just, just by virtue of being alive and being human. Right. So let's see what kind of comments. You got a good comment about Andrew Yang. Ah, don't be fooled by Andrew <laughs> Yang. <laughs> I was initially a supporter until I found out the reason he supports UBI is to get rid of all the other social programs. Right. That's a, a yeah, very that's important very point. I was so disappointed when he came out with that statement that it would be a supplement to other social programs. No, 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 no. It should be in addition to other social programs. Yeah. Um, I know. UBI is kind of weird. I don't know. Like, I think it's good, I guess. But yeah. I don't know. It kind For me of seems personally, like that like payoff to like keep the masses from well, revolting. That's how it feels. That's 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 another good point as well. Um, <laughs> keeping them just comfortable enough right, that exactly. they don't complain. That's like what it feels like to me. I sure. mean, like I think it is good in theory, maybe. But it is good in theory. I think what I for myself, what I think would be better would be universal health, yeah, universal exactly. housing. Universal exactly. education, transportation, these sorts of things. Providing yeah. these goods and services yeah. rather than the money to purchase them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Also because these, these things, prices could fluctuate wildly. Yeah, I mean, healthcare is a great example of that. Right. For most of people's lives, the average person is not going to need too much health care until like the last like, three or four years of their life. And then it just, the, car, the cost just skyrocket to the point where no one can keep up with it. Um, the same is, is, is true of housing. Housing can fluctuate wildly just based on simple geography changes, you know, or, or changes in demographics, mm-hmm. changing neighborhoods and stuff like that. If you had a guaranteed place to live, then no one could force you out because of, of rents going up. Because there wouldn't be a rent, you know? You would, you would always be able to have at least that one place for right. yourself. So that would, that would put a stop to gentrification in its tracks in a way that UBI couldn't, really. UBI could, is definitely a good supplement. I think it's one of those things that it's, it would be a good incremental step, but ultimately, <coughs> excuse me, ultimately we need something a little bit, bit more. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, yes, the execution of it would be, would be everything. How they implemented it would be, yeah. would make a huge difference. Definitely. Very good point. Well, we're coming up on the end of the book here, or the end of the chapter, I should say. Not quite the end of the book. We've still got a few more chapters to go, but let's continue on. They are eager to temper their principle. They say, society will not fail to maintain and bring up its children, to help both aged and infirm. Without doubt, needs will be the measure of the cost that society will burden itself with, to temper the principle of deeds. Charity, charity, always Christian charity, organized by the state this time. They believe in improving asylums for foundlings, in affecting old age and sick insurances, so as to temper their principle. But they cannot yet throw aside the idea of wounding first and healing afterwards. Thus, after having denied communism, after having laughed at their ease at the formula to each according to his needs, these great economists discover that they have forgotten something, the needs of the producers, which they now admit. Only it is for the state to estimate them, for the state to verify if the needs are not disproportionate to the work the state will dole out charity. Thence to the English poor law in the workhouse is but a step. There is but a degree, 
because even this stepmother of a society against whom we are in revolt has also been compelled to temper her individualist principles. She, too, has had to make concessions in a communist direction and under the same form of charity. Poverty, we have said elsewhere, was the primary cause of wealth. It was poverty that created the first capitalists because, before accumulating surplus value of which we hear so much, men had to be sufficiently destitute to consent to sell their labor so as to not die of hunger. It was poverty that made capitalists. And if the number of poor rapidly increased during the Middle Ages, it was due to the invasions and wars that followed the founding of states, and to the increase of riches resulting from the exploitation of the East that tore the bonds asunder, which once united agrarian and urban communities, and taught them to proclaim the principle of wages, so dear to exploiters, instead of the solidarity they formerly practiced. And it is this principle that is to spring from a revolution which men dare to call by the name of social revolution, a name so clear to the starved, the oppressed, and the sufferers? It can never be. For the day on which old institutions will fall under the proletarian acts, voices will call, bread, shelter, ease for all. And those voices will be listened to. The people will say, let us begin by allaying our thirst for life, for happiness, for liberty, that we have never quenched. And when we shall have tasted of this joy, we will set to work to demolish the last vestiges of middle-class rule, its morality drawn from account books, its debit and credit philosophy, its mine and yours institutions. In demolishing we shall build, as Proudhon said, and we shall build in the name of communism and anarchy. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube. All right, well, that's the end of the chapter. Cool. Any final thoughts as, as we wrap up here? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Did it give you a lot to, to kind of mull over? Yeah, well, it's very, well, I know this is all about theory, so this is going to yeah. be an obvious comment, but that was very theoretical. <laughs> it, oh, absolutely, it was very theoretical. Absolutely. So what does it mean in practice? Absolutely, yeah. I think in practice it, it, it means just starting by Reorient, starting to reorient your thinking, first about what's what's possible, yeah, and but but also about what some of the, the possible <laughs> alternatives could look like to you. What what would be comfortable to you? What would be a good path to to get to some of these goals and stuff like that? And for mm -hmm. for myself, it would look something like um, just the pro proliferation of worker-owned cooperatives as much as possible throughout the country. Um, and taking st and then taking the, the power that, that's generated through each of these cooperatives to help start more cooperatives both in, in terms of enterprises but right. also cooperative housing and franchising people in, in various parts of their lives and, and just focus on the, 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 the basic needs of, of life housing, health, education clean food and water um, transportation communication these sorts of things and just what whichever one of those things appeals to you um doing your best to to at some point form a cooperative a worker own cooperative around it and then using the, the profits from that to form more and more cooperatives of, right. of various things yeah. what about you what, what are your dreams of, of moving the country in a, a direction you would like seeing well yeah i think i think It'd be cool to see the worker-owned cooperative model, like, I kind of am like that and like a, like, commune. Mm -hmm. Like, both of those things can be done now. Yeah. Well, so, commune, it, they've, they've made it very legally difficult, especially if you're talking about out on the land. Uh-huh. There's all sorts of, of local regulations that they instituted across the country during like the 70s, especially when there's yeah. a big back to the land movement, where it would be things like no more than, than two unrelated people can live on any given piece of property. Mm. Um, but it's, it's still possible. Yeah. There are communes, at least yeah. in this country. Yeah. So it's like if these models are better, like they should be better. So mm -hmm. let's like test them and do them and prove that they're better. But I think in general, like making the more stuff free, 
free healthcare, free education. I think like free fruits and vegetables. I think all fruits and vegetables should be free. Yeah, that'd be awesome. That would give people an incentive to eat them. Absolutely. And they do health promoting foods and that'd be cool. So that's my platform. Sure. <laughs> even, even if we started with something like a, a food recovery program, you know, taking mm-hmm. the rampant waste from grocery stores and, yeah. and, and um, there are companies doing that. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, there could be a lot more and they could do, uh, they, Actually, they want I you to thumbs up from stupid kid on uh, free fruits and vegetables. Yeah. Uh, oh. perennial green wants you to promote your company. Oh yeah. Omada health. Yeah. Okay. Tell, <laughs> tell us, us about Omada health. What, what do uh, they do? Speaking of getting healthier, you can get healthier on the Omada program. Um, yeah. And, uh, Right now, if you have to, if you work for a company that has purchased our services, it's free of charge. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, um, but yeah, it's a cool program to get healthier. So check us out. I'm on a health. Very yeah. cool. Very cool. Uh, yeah, free public housing, says Duke. That, that would be game changing. That, that right. would solve so many problems of, of communities being broken up due to gentrification. Right. And just changing demographics. That would help people. Yeah, it doesn't seem that build real hard. stability. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the government, local. That's something that can be done on the local level as well. Right. Especially if you're in a larger city, you can push your city to make more uh, public housing. <laughs> nice emote. I don't know what that is. Is that a Joe Biden? <laughs> <laughs> don't. I, I'm not familiar with that particular emote, stupid kid. But <laughs> it's very important. Wait, can we go to the go to it here? Yeah, we can. You can see it a little larger. Oh, is that like Vince McMahon or oh, something? It says Coney Shake. <laughs> no idea what that means. Seems good. Shake. Shake. Okay. Twitch, <laughs> Twitch is, is, is such a strange culture. <laughs> All these, these various emotes that have come to represent these complex ideas, but, but only yeah. make sense within the Twitchiverse. It's cool. Oh, it's Vince McMahon. Vince McMahon. Okay. What did I say? Did I say he said, said shake. No, I know, but yeah, it's like the wrestling guy, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, okay. Yeah, he is the wrestling guy. Yeah. Coney shake. I've not. <laughs> See, yeah. Yeah, that guy. That that's the Vince McMahon I'm, I'm used to. The yeah. oh. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, the the it's the the alternative to the galaxy brain. That guy maybe. is an exploitative or exploiter oh, he's owner. <laughs> he's like he's like best friends with Donald Trump. Yeah, so. he and like. Yeah. Wrestlers get treated so terrible. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm not surprised by that at all. Yeah, exactly. All right, well, any other thoughts? What did you think about uh, coming on the live stream? Is it it's fun. Fun it's experience? Cool. It's cool to see the setup and, yeah, see how it's done uh, behind the scenes. Very cool. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Oh, thanks for being on. I really yeah. appreciate it. it yeah. Fun. And happy birthday. It was just Devin's birthday. Thank you. Yesterday, so... Yeah. Hope you had a fun time out at the, the brewery there. We did. We had a good time out it's at cool. the brewery. It's cool to see some of your old friends there. Yeah. And before I forget, I just wanted to give a, a little plug to LibriVox. That was the, the free... Um, whoops. Don't want to move that. I want to move <laughs> my video. So LibriVox. Go to LibriVox.com and you can find tons of theory, which is available in audiobook form for free. And the, the book that I had mentioned earlier, What is Property, by um, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, mm-hmm. which I'm sure I'm completely butchering, but, you know, I don't speak French, so that's my excuse. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good read. It's very dry, but you'll, you'll definitely learn to think about property in a different way if you get into that one. I also mentioned David Graeber's Bullshit Jobs, so I want to give a little plug for that one, too. While I'm at it, uh, this is such an eye-opening <coughs> book, um, talking about just how many jobs out there, people who do them don't even consider them to be contributing to, to society in any meaningful way. Um, and what that says about things like work ethic and just so how we like value the whole things. thesis of the office, basically. Yeah, yeah right? basically. Like, all these jobs are dumb. But we're still spicy like, cats. I love it. And friends, yeah, these e- emotes are great. Oh, uh, I kept meaning. I kept meaning to ask you, Jelly Moon. I, I gave you a gift sub to Bleep Blomp Ben uh, a couple weeks ago. I think. I wonder if you saw that I had given that to you, and if you checked out his stuff yet. Uh, 
so we'll just move on. Anyway, you can buy uh, bullshit jobs at Red Emma's, which is a, a really great online source for. Um, <coughs> ben, 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 Ben. Okay, <laughs> cool. Uh, <laughs> Red Emma's, great, great source. If you don't want to go through Amazon to get, ah, uh, you do have the emails from Blue Pump Ben. That's awesome. He's he's a great Minnesota streamer as well. Uh, he just moved to Minneapolis, and he's he's. He's, he does some really cool stuff. He makes original YouTube videos on, on different themes. You know, usually just five to ten minute bites on stuff. <laughs> Very nice. Um, so, yeah, check out Blue Bump Ben as well. Uh, and also, Bullshit Jobs. Go to Red Emma's. Um, don't have to deal with Amazon that way. Don't give money to them. This is, a, I believe, they are a worker-owned cooperative. Uh, Red Emma's. And then, finally, uh, Professor Wolf I had mentioned a few times. Just want to get a plug in for him as well. Also search his stuff out on YouTube. He's got some really, he's, he's basically the, the Carl Sagan of uh, leftist theory. He's really good at taking these complex economic ideas and just breaking them down in ways that are really easy for the average person to understand. So check out Richard Wolf. I watched him debate well. destiny. Oh, that was <laughs> such a, it was, it was a trouncing is yeah. what it was. Yeah. Destiny acted like the kid who is like, yeah, He's so dominant. Freshman philosopher, like, oh, I've, I've read a book on, on, you know, Hegel, and now I'm going to school you and everything about right. the Hegelians. And, 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 but in actuality, knew nothing. It was, it was like three hours of, of Destiny petulantly demanding for definitions and Wolf giving them to him. Yeah. <laughs> Destiny bad. Yeah. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm definitely not a Destiny stan myself. Nice. That would be some drama we can stir up. Oh, yeah. Oh, I can only <laughs> hope that his entire... <laughs> right. Almost, you probably like, don't want that. A few hundred thousand <laughs> community goes after me. <laughs> Actually, I do want that. Come at me, Destiny. <laughs> for no reason. You, don't, you, you have no reason to know who I am or debate me on anything, but be mad so that I can get famous. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's the path. That is the path. <laughs> All right. Cool. So, yeah, I think I'll just do one more plug. If you like this sort of thing and you want to see YouTube videos of it, if there's some parts of it that you missed, you can go to my link tree. For those of you listening on the podcast, that's L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash bread underscore theory. And you can find links to my Twitch, YouTube, podcast, Facebook, Twitter, a whole bunch of different stuff that I do. You can buy my art. Uh, You can find the Left Signal Boost database, which I haven't plugged in a while. Oh, something went wrong with that. I'll have to check out that link again. That's not working. Uh, you can check out LeftPod posting, the various groups that I run. Um, so that is the, the place to find all of my stuff. I think we're probably going to wrap it up now, though, and I will go ahead and raid you into another streamer. Uh, so until next time, which uh, the next stream is going to be Sunday night at 7 p.m., where we're going to do whatever we feel like. And, and uh, Amanda hopefully will be joining me again. We can, we can roast maybe some more right-wingers or just look at whatever videos we, we feel like talking about. So check that out, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time on Sundays. Otherwise, we do theory every Friday night uh, at 7 p.m., usually around 7 to 9. Ran a bit long tonight. Had a lot to talk about. Um, so yeah, until next time, Lectam. And I, I promise you I'll, I will get to the heart of what that acronym stands for in one of these videos eventually, one of these streams. So that's something else you can look forward to.